Give me the touch. Write it on the screen. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. You are listening to episode 341 of the program, recorded live on February 12th, 2019. Joining me is Hody Johns of Wall Daily. We've got Reinhold is here of Wall Daily. We've got uh, of Wino fame, and though we've got Harry, Harry's here as well. So we'll uh, we'll get started. We're going to talk about Bill Weld. We're going to talk building movements, and we're going to talk about just being exhausted with politics. So we'll we'll get started right after. This. Warning: This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. <laughs> Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Thank you, disembodied voice. Still love that intro. Just just made the final payment. <laughs> got that got that intro on payments, Harry. You need to come up with a name for him now. I don't know. Uh, Maya. Uh, so Harry, how are you tonight, Harry Price? Going good. Going good. Excellent. We've got uh, we've got Reinhold here. How are you, Reinhold? I'm doing well. A little tired, but. Good to go. You seem a little. You see. You but you have the death wish coffee now. Death wish, I've, I have no uh, no adrenal gland left. <laughs> Apparently not. Yeah, and, and then I've blown through it so so much. So this is probably. I'll probably go take a nap after I drink this. Pull that mic closer to you for me. And then Hody Johns, how are you doing? We'll do. Awesome. As always, when I'm on the main show, I'm feeling like a ham. Yeah, you are. You're in beautiful Salt Lake City. Uh, Hody is our favorite Mormon. He has not had, uh, just Sprite for you, right? Uh, yeah. And even then sometimes I get a little twitchy. <laughs> That's all that sugar. Yeah. sugar uh, will do anything above two aspirin is hard drugs for me. Now Oof. being from <laughs> aspirin <Yes>. now <laughs> being from Salt Lake is, uh, do you have snowshoes on? Like how bad's the snow there? So I, I don't, I can't even believe this because most of the time I'm from, I'm from Colorado, moved to Utah. I'm used to the Rocky mountains. Most of the time I, you guys are laughing at us because we're covered in snow. Somehow this polar vortex just completely hit you guys has totally missed us. We've maybe got like an inch in the last two weeks. Wow. But you need it because you have skiing hills and things. Yeah, we actually like the snow here. Uh, We don't have to set our railroad tracks on fire like they do in Chicago. (laughs) <laughs> wow i didn't know they did that yeah so the uh the railroad tracks i guess the thing is you know what the railroads here they plan on it getting too cold so they make the steel out of this certain density that when it gets cold it doesn't crack taggart steel and, yeah <laughs> yeah in, uh, <laughs> in chicago they had to uh put petroleum on the tracks and set it on fire to uh, to get it a little bit warmer, so that when the trains didn't go over them, that they didn't crack. I don't think they actually had an accident. It was like a precaution, but it was pretty cool looking. How how do I get that job? Because as a as a low key pyromaniac, that sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm I w- guessing that job is like reserved for uh, government bureaucrats that you know kiss a lot of butt. Yeah, you know, for low key pyromaniacs, firefighting is the best place to go. Really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then I have to like, I just watched Backdraft. Then I'd have to like carry hoses <laughs> uh, and race my brother upstairs. I don't want to do all that and die. You don't think you beat your brother? Mm. Uh, I'd I'd beat him in a TV watching contest, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I am I'm svelte. Uh, Hody, you've lost a bunch of weight. Uh, how much have you lost, and what what are you doing? Yeah, so um, I'm with the Keto Tarians group the uh, Keto Libertarians group. And I've gone from 240 
I've been at 208 the last couple of days. I haven't broken anything, but maybe haven't been working out as hard as I could. Feeling great, losing lots of weight, and uh, yeah, keto's great. I started it a week and a half ago. I went from 271 to 264, uh, and I've cheated aggressively on at least two days. <laughs> uh, like by the third day, you just go, I can't take it. Like today, I went, I'm having a cheeseburger. I don't care. <laughs> You can't have the cheeseburger. You can have the cheeseburger, just don't have the bread. Yeah, well, that's not carbs. what my gut, but my gut biome said. Uh, no, I have, I have had, I, I was eating horribly, and I w- amazingly had not gained any weight, and but I was just feeling foggy and miserable, and I really do love how I feel. I don't, I, I like people. Oh, you're gonna feel like Superman. I don't agree with that. I don't, not, not at this point. But maybe I need to get to like ketosis to actually get there but yeah. but uh i definitely do feel a ton better just you know even on days that i have less than 20 carbs mm-hmm. which has been more than not do but. a six day fast you'll feel like superman what do you eat on a fast water yeah no that's not happening <laughs> that's <laughs> no Mm-mm. six days yeah hey, when was the last time you did that I actually did it about, I think, a year and a half ago. I feel like Harry Hody, and Ryan Hody, you can back me up. I feel like Harry gives this advice, but he's never done it in his life. It's the Venezuelan diet he's on. What? He, he's uh, Harry's keto. Keto. Uh, Ryan Hold is carbo. <laughs> he, was, he was talking about pizza, right? Before, <laughs> and I about kicked him out. I was like, if you mention pizza one more time, <laughs> it, would, it, it would make sense if we're all here anyway. <laughs> you can have we're doing a show you can have pizza on, on the ketogenic diet it would be fun just, just no sauce and no crust that's yeah. totally you great off, yeah you scrape off the devil crust i was surprised when i did when i did keto that you could go to any like fast food place order a sandwich and just say you want it you know without the bread on it or yeah they do it all times so. yeah in college i did atkins and i was very mm-hmm. aggressive about it and i lost 30 pounds in a month but I did it the month before my birthday, and I celebrated my birthday at Penn Station, mm. and it wrecked everything. That was the best sandwich I've ever had in my life. It, it, the only thing comparable, so bread. it was day four, and I had had like almost no carbs like at the beginning of this month. And I just, I couldn't take it. I was feeling a little hypoglycemic, which you do kind of in the beginning feel a little hypoglycemic, but that goes away. And I just, I had a mini Snickers bar and it was the greatest thing that has ever happened in my mouth. I got that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my. The, <laughs> the Mormon. We got to dig, yeah. dig up some uh, history. Here. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, you just got to find those same treats that you like in the ketogenic like, to like go after it. There's, you, there's chocolate uh, teas that you can get. Yeah, Atkins makes uh, like these little squares. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're great. They actually, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years ago when I did the Atkins and you bought like those bars, it was like alcohol, sugar, it tasted so weird. Mm-hmm. This tastes like an actual chocolate mm-hmm. caramel thing. Like, And there's so many different flavors of more pork rind companies that are making different flavors. So you can get something besides just salt, pepper, and hot and spicy. You yeah. know, I've been drinking a lot of the spicy dill pickle um, pork mm-hmm. rinds from Small Batch. And they also make a nice coleslaw one, which is really good with those like, coleslaw. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's called small batch. Um, yes, yeah, small batch pork rinds, really good. I love them. Follow them on Instagram. I might, I might, I might, have, they, I might have had a bag of their uh, yeah, Korean barbecue. Their Korean barbecue was delicious. <laughs> when they, they can do the Lay's, um, what was it biscuits and gravy flavor? Oh, now we can talk. Mm. Oh. That is so good. Yeah. Oh, but no. there's just things you just got to trick yourself when you're on the ketogenic diet of stuff you can and cannot have, you know? Right. And you also do understand that, like, sometimes you just got to have your carb cheat day like I do. I cheat on Fridays and, you know, drink beer, you know? Yeah. And it feels great. Well, I've kind of been tiptoeing into it. And so I, I haven't felt the uh, – I haven't felt like, all right, in the beginning it's going to be a lot harder. And so I don't need to be as aggressive about it. And I, I learned this when I lost, like I've lost 10 pounds every year for the last couple of years. I, my height was 330. I'm at 264 now. Uh, and I got back up to 290 in, in 2016. And like 
that first 60 pounds, it was, it was all using my fitness pal and learning how to eat. It's like I was eating 5,000 calories a day. Don't make that face because it's so easy to do. You, uh, I do it. An egg McMuffin and a hash brown, two hash browns from McDonald's for breakfast. You have a Coke at work, maybe a candy bar or two at some point through the day. You go eat, some, you know, brew burger and some fast, you know, chilies for lunch. And then you go to Buffalo Wild Wings for dinner. And like, and then it, 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 you add it all up and you just go, I've been eating five, 6,000 calories a day without even really thinking about it. That is a crazy amount of calories. It is. <laughs> but I've got full listening to your breakfast. It's so easy to do. And I, I like using my fitness pal, I have lost that first 60 pounds, gained it back, and I've lost it again continuously just by eating more low carb. But then now I've just got like this visceral fat in the gut that I just can't get rid of. Even when I was doing personal training all the time, it's like, all right, let me, let me try something a little more radical. I couldn't imagine doing keto my entire life. I'd go crazy. Like, awesome. like I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Harry, you, you were on keto all the time. Like it to me would be, I, I don't know. I, I'm not into sweets. So, it's, so I don't right. have that temptation. Like, Oh man, I've got to have sugar. And if I do, I'll, I'll eat it, but then I'm just, I'll get right back off it. Yeah. Um, the major carb thing I like is beer. Um, yeah. I'm actually fi- uh, I do enjoy pastas and bread. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy that stuff. But, you know, I think the hardest thing for me to, to stop eating on the ketogenic diet from being keto is rice. I love mm. rice. Yes. Sushi. I could, yeah. I, no, I could just eat white rice. Hody, just, just put it in a bowl. I agree with you. Yes. Sugar just, yeah, just <laughs> sugar. Soy sauce. Sugar. Yeah. Soy sauce. Sugar, right? Just, yeah. Yeah. Hody, you put sugar on rice? Uh, no, I, I oh, did. Man. Yeah, you take, mm, yeah, you take so the old good. leftovers, scrape off hard sh- off oh. the off the side because you don't waste rice, and you put a little sugar on it and a little butter. Sushi, rice krispies, sushi rice with butter and an egg on top. Nothing better. Hody, I was I was in uh, Kroger the other day, and that sushi, that grocery store sushi, was speaking to me on spiritual levels. I was just, ooh, daddy. That's my problem. I go to I go to Kroger and do the. Uh, the weekly shopping and then i'm walking by and i'm like all right and i'm taking the sushi with me and we're <laughs> right. gonna go out and i eat it on the way home <laughs> right yeah i need a shopping yep. treat if we're imba- admitting embarrassing things i could eat oh. my dinner at like 7-eleven with those rolly things i just get like four of each flavor and i'm a happy guy with, with tornadoes or whatever they're calling them oh, oh. my gosh those little taquitos I, I i could have dinner there no, it's, it's talking about five thousand calories a day. I go to like if I go to McDonald's, I don't get one sandwich. Oh yeah, no I, way. Uh, Aaron Aaron Ewart caught me one time because he showed up early, and I'd gone to Chick Fil A, and I'd gotten my usual order, which was the chicken the chicken sandwich, a number one with pepper jack cheese, large fry, large lemonade, and then you get the the Chick Fil A sauce and the ketchup, and you put that on there. You know what? Give me another sandwich. And yeah. he and so when I went to Chick Fil A. He goes, uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to Chick-fil-A for lunch. He's like, one sandwich. I was like, shut up, dad. <laughs> I, I remember watching my dad do that growing up. He'd go to McDonald's, he'd get two quarter pounders, and he was huge, and then he lost a bunch of weight in his 40s, and it was like, yeah, I just stopped eating a second sandwich. I was yeah. like, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. It really, you don't, I don't think you even need well, keto. You just need to, like, do the MyFitnessPal app, do some exercise, like the mm-hmm. daily, the daily burn, on Roku, I've been doing that this month, and I've really enjoyed that. I like going to the gym, but like some days you're just like, I'm, I don't want to do. It's like I don't know how women put on makeup every day. I'm well, like, I don't want to get into all the clothes. I'll just do naked yoga. It's fine. Speaking of the women, though, they're going to be upset when they hear things like, "All I have to do to lose weight is stop drinking cokes," <laughs> and they're like, oh, "I stopped drinking cokes and I lost one pound," oh. and I'm like. Well, I lost about 15, 20 in a week and a half. Yeah. You what, know, it, just it, from that. My coworker stopped drinking a mountain, three Mountain Dews mm-hmm. a day, and she lost 10 pounds. I mean, it's I drink just, like six Cokes a day. It really is a lot of too, – it's too many carbs. Yeah. It's too much water weight. Too much sugar. You just, yeah, too much sugar. And my sugar. doctor tells me, she goes, that Coke is just liquid sugar. Yep. All you're doing yep. is drinking sugar. Yep. Stop it. Yep. If it's not been alive <laughs> in the last 30 days, don't eat it. Well, the thing is – well, that's not true. You don't want, you know, don't, don't live with that. Don't live with that because you're going to cut yourself <laughs> off with so many awesome, amazing Italian meats. Don't listen to that. Uh, <laughs> what? It, well, like, I mean, it doesn't, it's but, an 80 20 rule. Okay. Okay. okay like okay, 80% okay, of the okay, time, okay, do okay. what you're supposed to do, but 20% of the time, it's fine. All right. I, was, I have, I have, I, I have, if you'd like some, I have a charcuterie board in there. I have 
prosciutto, salami. Well, considering you won't pepperoni. eat it because after 30 days, I will get up and eat that for you. Um, <laughs> But um, if I'm on, if we're all admitting awful things, mm-hmm. I'll share too because I don't drink sodas. I don't know if you guys noticed. Right. Um, I don't drink a lot of sugary sodas. I don't at all. But the main thing, the one thing that did get me to quit, because I used to pound them all the time. But the thing that got me to quit, I'll admit it, was Alex Jones because of the high fructose corn syrup. It's, <laughs> it's mercury in it. You can't, you can't drink it. Yeah. That's why you buy the real sugar stuff. You don't buy the. Yeah, I used to do the real sugar, sugar stuff. Yeah. yeah. But I stopped until I couldn't find like real sugar Dr. Pepper anymore. Yeah, I ordered it from Texas at one point. Yeah. And it did taste better. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so much better. Well, I used to get mix, uh, the Cokes from Mexico. The Mexican yeah. Coke yeah. is so much better. I know. Because I, I miss my bottles. I, mean, I, grew, I grew up in, well, we, we used to have to yeah. take the bottles back and return them and everything. Back in the oh, 40s. I miss the bottle. Right. Yeah. There's a flavor to it that's different. Yeah, yeah. It, I totally well, agree. Hody, uh, go ahead. I was yeah. going to say, like, in um, um, Venezuela, uh, they encouraged a tax on sugar soda, so... That's what the Coke that they made down there in Venezuela. So that's why Coca Cola pulled it out of Venezuela because they increased the tax, was taking it over right. because they made sugar drinks, real sugar. Now, Hody, have you ever been tempted by the devil and had uh, a Coke or a Mountain Dew or some form of soda? Uh, like ever or during this keto part? No, just ever. Yeah. In the last oh, 10. Oh, yeah. So um, Mormons are actually allowed to have soda. We actually clarified what? that. We actually had our president clarify that. Because uh, e- even our last president drank like Diet Cokes at the games, um, at, at like jazz games. And people are like, I thought you couldn't have soda. And they're like, look, it's this one verse that says don't drink like it says hot drinks. And by that, it means alcohol, like mead, <laughs> coffee, right? Uh, English booze, you know, that, that type of stuff. So you um, have a and uh yeah no yeah so no <laughs> virgin margaritas i think are still okay but that's it, we've actually clarified that so we are actually allowed to have soda um i haven't had any diet or otherwise starting um the keto di- the keto diet i haven't cheated myself yet but uh but yeah we're we're allowed to have those you look you mu- look much less fleshy you look very good look thank you it's dro- a lot dropped from my face. I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the diet drinks are just every bit as bad for you, maybe even worse than like regular soda. Like I, I just like to me, I've read stories of people who have like MS and then they stop drinking soda and their symptoms go away completely. Like it just, I don't know. I, it, to me, putting something that is manufactured in your body, like the, I just drink water all day long. Yeah. But when I, when I, when I do decide, to stop the cokes for whenever i do it I, it's it's always to, to drink water yeah i, I just say i'm done with water. i'll just do water because i everybody's like we well, can have all these other different drinks and things like that i'm like i don't care i mean i like the taste of cokes but if i'm not gonna have one a water's fine with me it tastes yeah. great i dated somebody at one point and she, you know i was a big fatso and uh was trying but she's like i just think exercise and eating right is like paying your bills going to the mm-hmm. dentist it's just part of being a grown-up yeah. You, when you're young, you can eat whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, and it doesn't really matter, and you feel good. But then, like, at 35, if I don't go to the gym or work out within three days, I feel awful. Yep. Like, I just I think it's okay. important to actually take care of yourself physically. Here's a bit of advice for the uh, young listeners out there. Uh, your body will retain the information that you store into it of working out and yeah. being physically fit. So if you stay fit, you'll just and then do a couple of binges it's easier for you to go backwards yeah it's it's honestly i wish like i was really in shape in in high school and college somewhat like i would go to the gym and work out and then you know at some point i stopped and i just think about like why did i let myself get that miserable why did i let myself get that lazy my goal was literally on a weekend to not move a muscle Mm. not go anywhere order in what it just was a miserable existence we're going to talk a little bit about this uh on the bonus talking uh uh, i think yeah we'll make it we'll make it bonus so check it out we're going to continue this conversation about what it means to be an adult because i i just i'll I'll be honest listen to that one you'll be here uh you don't get to leave uh i'm i'm honest i'm honestly so fed up with politics and it you know I've always been a big fan of personal growth and having goals and Zig Ziglar, Napoleon Hill, all that stuff. And then I read Mary Ruart's 
uh, Healing the World. And for me, it was like, that was the first book. And Hody, we ought to, we're, we ought to talk about the book club in a second. We ought to do that in a couple months. But it was the awesome. first time I connected like personal growth to libertarianism. It was just like, wow, okay. Dave Ramsey's probably done more in the last decade to financially secure the United States of America than the federal government has. You know, because mm-hmm. so many people are taking his class and getting mm-hmm. their personal finances and, you know, that savings rate has an effect on the banks. And, you know, I think just so we'll talk a little bit about the connection between libertarianism and personal growth. But, uh, Hody, do you want to plug the book club? Uh, what are we reading this month and next? And uh, how do you get involved? Yeah, so the book club is going great. We had an amazing conversation on it. If you are a Patreon uh, donator. Thank you. And you got to listen to our conversation about it. We, uh, we've started with them, uh, why we hate each other and ha- how to fix it, uh, by Ben Sass. Just a great book. I think all of us loved it. Five yeah. stars changed our lives, uh, completely altered my social media habits. Um, that was a great, I love that we are doing a mix of like pol- politics, uh, personal health, good advice books. We've got some like exercise books in there. Like I just, I just think the book club's going to be great for giving you a lot of different things. We've got a history book coming up next month. Not to get ahead of myself this month, we're reading the, a libertarian, the libertarian mind, a manifesto for freedom by David Bose. It drives me crazy that he pronounces it Bose because it is like how you spell Boaz in the Bible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but apparently he likes it pronounced Bose, but yeah, the libertarian mind, I've already finished it. I won't spoil it for you. It is fantastic. Uh, it's, it's one of those, I feel like mere Christianity is to Christianity. Like it's a great intro book. If you're skeptical on Christianity. A lot of people think because of the name, mere Christianity is like intended for like high level intellectual Christians. It's like, no, it's the intro book that you get right. to. It addresses a lot of the hiccups that you have early, problems that you might have with Christianity and helps you overcome them. I find that that's what the libertarian mind is. Is It's like the number one go-to book. If somebody says, I'm curious about libertarianism, but I just... I'm not concerned. I'm concerned about these things. I'm not sure about them. He really kind of lays it out before like really hitting you hard with great Liberty stuff in like the last quarter of the book. Um, Next month we got Liberty's first crisis, which is about uh, this book. I have not read. I haven't even started reading yet. Most of the time I'm ahead of the curve here, but uh, halfway through. And it basically is the founding generation arguing over illegal immigrants and censoring the new the new media (laughs) so it's a very timely book and and it's really uh, an easy read the libertarian mind not as easy of a read as uh, the first and the third book Um, so we're trying to mix it up between you know not just do not let's let's start with you know human action and read through that and do predictable stuff like we want to do something that's a little bit uh, this audience is very much newer to libertarianism and to politics and so uh, we're trying to, you know, it, it show you the way that we think and also make you think a, a, in a different way. So I think once you, one of the founding principles in, in my view when I do analysis, uh, them I thought was really important because it was good to start off because it's about community and loneliness and gathering people together. It was really good. And then the second book is a foundational libertarian book. Um, and we're not just reading libertarian books, which is why I intentionally started with them. And then the third book is about history because I think history is one of the most important pieces that we so often miss when doing political analysis and societal analysis. And I think you're just going to, when you read this book, you're going to go, wow, we haven't changed as a people since the beginning. I mean, it's the, the alien and sedition acts, which is what the book is about is, so much of what the conversations are today you know so we'll probably hody i think alternate from you know an an off libertarian book to a libertarian book maybe uh maybe we do mary ruart after that uh just because i don't want it to be a libertarian book club where we're only reading libertarian stuff because i want i want non-libertarians to see this and hopefully get involved or if you listen and you're not totally like i'm not totally a libertarian i'm i I want you to feel comfortable getting involved in this and joining us on the, we do a video chat with each other and bring 
on the book and then we post that for our patrons to listen to. Yeah, the fourth Sunday every month we'll be discussing the old book and that's when we'll start the new book. Um, so you have plenty of time to still read The Libertarian Mind to get in on that few weeks. And then if you want to join us the month after that, it's never too late, just a book a month. Um, it's We're on Goodreads. That's how you can find us. We're Libertarians Book Club. Uh, you can find the links from our page and we are libertarians.com. We are libertarians.com. And uh, yeah, and, and I, I thought it was cool. We even got some, uh, we got somebody, uh, Hadley in the, in the club who's completely disconnected from social media, but was like, yeah, I joined you on the book club and he joined our conversation. That was really cool to meet somebody. Yeah. So we want to be readers and uh, build up this foundational knowledge because it's important. So that's why it is so important. And you know, uh, another that that's just an important principle is reading and making sure that we are our our minds are sharp and that we're engaged in the community that we're reading history that we're not just focusing on libertarianism uh and so that's why we do this now um let's see i want to i want to thank our patrons uh this is this is a good time harry to stop thank all the patrons and appreciate what they do what 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 patrons do so if you think about the word patron like think about you know 1500 and near machiavelli and you're writing this you have this or your da vinci or you're creating some form of art or intellectual prod project you needed someone to fund your research fund your project and you had to find one person who was in power to fund your study. This is still really how it's kind of done with either government grants or, you know, through foundations. And what Patreon has allowed us to do and what the internet has allowed us to do overall is break that funding model apart. And so we follow something called the value for value model created by our friends over at the No Agenda Show, blatantly stolen from them. Uh, and I mean, you've listened to No Agenda Forever, which is a great podcast. Can you explain the the, the model a little bit? The, the value for value model? Yes. Basically, if you get value uh, for what is being presented to you, you can pay back in kind to keep that going again. Right. So if, if you want to, so if you want to see this continue, if you want to uh, keep having these conversations and listen to what we're doing and the expansions that we're doing, the, the Wall Daily, the book clubs, all kinds of stuff. I've been hearing some things coming up, possibly with the store. And we're we're gonna and, we're gonna fund some new T-shirts right. so you can have cool so, libertarian swag. We're going to uh, really roll out liberty and chill, but not centralize it. We're gonna decentralize it. You know, and and it, and it keeps us from having. Okay, so if we wanted to continue doing this and still have money coming in, we would have to go to advertising advertisers would then come and say, well, you can't say this, you can't right. say that. You could lose your advertisers if you say the wrong thing. By having the people who are getting value for what we're doing to pay us directly, we can avoid all that. Right. Yeah. So it is, it is about you getting involved in this. Uh, the, the reality is that We Are Libertarians is obviously headed by me. It was something that I've started and spearheaded. You know, there's been people like, uh, you know, Joe Ruiz was on 48 episodes. Greg Lenz was on 207 episodes. Uh, you know, Bittner, uh, 26. Um, let's see, Reinhold, how many have you been on? Creighton, 68. Galt, 46. Uh, the, website's not, the website's not accurate online. Oh, so. oh it isn't? Okay. No. I think okay. I've been on like 14. Okay. Hody's, Hody's done 33 dailies. Sarah's mm -hmm. done 21. I've hosted 429 of them. Harry at 85 uh, it still doesn't know to turn off his cell phone. Um, first off, that's an alarm to remind me to uh, brush Gunther's teeth. <laughs> oh, okay. So, well, it's allowed. It's very cute. Uh, Gunther so who's, has brush, who's brushing the teeth now since uh, you're not there doing it? Uh, I'm really hoping that someone will do it at the house. <laughs> but the alarm went off here. Yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a. I see a flaw here. Yeah, it's a small flaw, but um, I'm sure, and I, you know, full confidence that one of the servants at the house will get it done. So all right, uh, so th everybody like Hody gives their time, and uh, I, I candidly make 
two, three hundred bucks a month off of this. But I've also put in twenty to thirty thousand dollars of my own money for the first decade to get us here. Uh, so I don't feel guilty about taking a couple hundred bucks out of that for gas and other other things. But you know, we got bills and we got all these different people who are involved in this and who create content and give their time weekly. These are busy people who are putting together a show every single day for you uh, that are, you know, I'm running the website, paying for all the services. You may be listening on Spotify or you may be listening on YouTube or you may be listening in other places. It takes a lot of time to create something as big as this. And uh, we're really starting, I think, to get some notoriety and some conversation around what we do and our style of libertarianism. Our substance is not fundamentally different than anything that most libertarians believe, but our style, I think, is, is something that is different, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight, and that we're not trying to be pricks. We're, we're provocative because we want to make you think, we want to get your attention, but I, I think that when you look at the people that are involved in We Are Libertarians, especially right now in this generation of co-hosts and this generation of writers, research members, uh, patrons, people who make up the community, it's a lot of people who really do care about libertarianism, but applying it to their community and really growing their immediate world in a more libertarian direction and doing it in a way that leads with love as opposed to leading with jihadism <laughs> i mean derision uh, der outrage right things like that so first and foremost we want to thank christy avery craig da costa uh, we want to thank jason doolittle the libertarian coalition ed brehab and a new uh, see this is where libertarian coalition and liberty memes is at 25 dollars a month uh, but we now at a hundred dollars a month have the page memerty libs <laughs> <laughs> so it's like liberty memes but backwards and so it's all like if you go to it's one of the uh, thousands of offshoots when they yeah. right facebook or instagram you can follow both the libertarian coalition and me merdy libs and uh f support them they're a hundred dollars a month subscribers they do that because they want to mention on the show it's it's a really sneaky way to advertise on the show if you're a, a smaller libertarian brand hundred dollars a month and uh then i i Say, hey, these guys support us. Support well, hundred dollars gets you on the show too, doesn't it? Uh, uh, yeah, and so I'm talking. So. I'm talking to a few of these people about coming on, and yeah, we've had Craig DaCosta, Christy, mm -hmm. Jason Doolittle have been in. Uh, intern Ed has not been. He's he's been on, but he has not been on. Uh, he will always be my intern. Um, <laughs> but you know, so the. Uh, these these are obviously the all stars at a hundred dollars a month, but there's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty five dollars, and so if you get something out of this show, if you would miss us if we were gone, if you've had an aha moment from this show, you have applied something that we have had a conversation about, it's made you think differently or treat people in your life differently, or you've understood libertarianism a little better, then pitch in. And that's all we ask. And if you can't do it financially, then share the show on social media. Give us five stars or volunteer to write or be on the research team or start a Liberty and Chill in your local community or participate in the book club. Or I've got one uh, person who is creating some really cool homemade stickers for as a thank you for our patrons. Mm -hmm. She's like, I have this talent and... I don't have a lot of money, but I'm willing to, I love doing this and this is my skill and this is my talent and I want to give back doing this. You know, uh, Craig DaCosta, thank you to Craig for sending us a piece of equipment off of our Amazon wish list. And I know that this is like a big long commercial and it feels that way, but it gets to the root of what I think new media is about, which is building a community and then interacting with that community online and enacting the principles that hold that community together out in your community. And so what We Are Libertarians is moving into over time is less about me and more about you. Less about Harry, less about Hody, less about us, and more about what you're going to do with what we talk about here. And Reinhold too. <laughs> uh, and so like it, because at the end of the, I like that we're like, it's not about us and Reinhold's like me. No, it's you all, didn't mention It's all about me. me. Uh, 
we don't leave him feeling left out on what who gets thought less of, right? right. Make right. sure to include him. And yeah. it's all them guys. Right. Focus it all here. <laughs> I, I needed to sustain myself. Uh, you know, and it is rooted in my Christian principles. And I've just been thinking a lot about this lately. You know, the government takes more responsibility when America's people take less responsibility. And I feel like we're at a point where we have the government doing too much and it's an inefficient system to take care of people because we're delegating that responsibility to them. And to do things effectively, we need to be the ones that step up and actually start participating in our community. We need to be the ones that take care of the poor, that run the homeless shelters. We need to be out and engaged in our community as libertarians because we can do it better. We can do it with more empathy. And we, and we can do it in a way it's not being forced Right. And so when your friends and family, the number one objection to libertarianism is always or, or no government is, well, who's going to take care of the people that I don't personally want to take care of? And they never like the answer you. But if you can say, well, me, I volunteer at a mm -hmm. clinic for mm -hmm. people who deal with this and I love it and I get so much out of it. And that's what I'm I'm invested in this. And it, you have to start modeling libertarianism and. We're just living literally. Yeah. So we keep saying that we're, we can, you know, we have these ideas that can the, exist without a government. Right. Nothing's stopping us from doing it. Why, right. why you know, if, if you believe that, live it, go mm -hmm. do it, prove the, prove the case. And then people will start accepting that as a, as a, a truism. They won't, you know, wonder what's going to happen because you'll be out there doing it. It's like when, the shutdown happened, and there were libertarians going out and cleaning the national parks. The great Jess Mears, the yeah. beautiful Jess Mears from the Libertarian National Party. She, she, you know, somebody said a joke, and she took and ran with it and started a movement. Gay rights, the mm -hmm. civil rights era, all of these things started in the culture. They started in the, in, the, uh, in the real world. And then the government was so pressed by its people to change that – it, but it starts with us actually yeah. making it. Government is reactionary. Right. Right. It, it only enacts something or work, does something when the majority of people tell it it needs to be done. Right. So why can't that majority of people just go do it? Why do they need the government to do it? So most yeah. of the times the government doesn't really need to. They just do because that's how they stay in power. Yeah. And so I just really feel like this audience, I've built this thing and it is a great way to connect with other people who are working on projects. And it's a great way to connect to some principles that we all are, are in agreement on and we all have kind of the same style. And so use this, use our groups, use our discord, use our communities to meet other libertarians that can help you achieve what you want to achieve in making social change in a peaceful manner because you know it, it th this is now to a point where it's so big that i can't centralize anything and i can't control the brand and like if you want to steal the logo and create a bunch of memes with our logo you know that are not you know, offensive i will deny you if you are doing something with uh if you're not covered by our racism insurance then no thank you um but you know like if you have an idea do it and if you need our help, then get in the group and ask. Like, mm -hmm. don't send me a private message. That's not what I want. I don't want you sending me a private right. message saying, I have an idea to do X. I want you to get in the group. Correct. Because there's other people in the group who could help. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm busy. Like, it's not that I don't care. It's that I just don't have time to help you. But there's a lot of people out there who are looking to help and who are looking to get involved. They don't know how. And so if you lead them, they will, they will walk along with you. But I personally cannot... You know, I reply to as many messages as possible, but it's it's to a point now where this is beyond me and it's yours and I don't want to control it, uh, you know, except when I'm here for these two hours a week. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, Hody, I don't even control the daily content. I don't I don't I just listen for sound quality, mm -hmm. edit it. I don't check it for content. I mean, of the he, he doesn't actually listen to them. I've listened to about half, <laughs> but he's smart ass. But uh, it, it is it's just a platform where I've said to like Hody and Reinhold, like you guys have something to say, do it. Yeah, that's uh, it's been my, uh, especially recently, I got to vent a little of my very rare Mormon anger on an episode and I had fun doing that. Uh, but it's, 
it's something that's very objective for me. I get a lot out of it, even though it's donated to the program for free. Uh, I think, you know, you look at video gaming right now and all of the companies that are making the most money are the ones that make free to play games. Well, why? Well, that's because when people find value in it, that's the point when they give you value as opposed to a beforehand investment. And that's kind of the way I've been dealing with weird libertarians is just saying like, man, they are really providing a lot of value to me. So I'm going to give something back. In my case, it's mostly time. I think I'm on the 10 or $15 something donation list, but the majority of what I can give is, is time and effort. And uh, we'll talk about a lot of my direction and where I'm going. Don't worry with the wall network and the bonus content, but uh Yeah, just a lot of different ideas. For me, I think it's all very exciting. I think what you said about it, I'm glad that we're the ground level for libertarians. I was thinking about that, especially in light of the Bill Weld thing, that I want people to find us before they find those violent, vile, (laughs) awful people that talk a lot of trash. I'm glad that we're the ground floor, and I hope we stay there for a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, join the Patreon. That's a great way to get connected. It puts you in certain groups. Get, in the, get on the website. Find the community that, that you're most interested in. We've got one. If you don't see one that you're interested in, then start one. Let me know. I'll put it up on the website. Like, just make it, Build your own community around the connection point that is this podcast. And uh, don't ask me for permission. Like, just do it. I mean, that's really where I'm to ask forgiveness. Yeah, because the reality is I'm getting burnt out on politics. I mean, at least for the next few months, I can just tell like it's going to be a couple months before I really can give it. You got to have a little bit of a break before the 2020 starts ramping up, which is happening already. You know, and so if there's people out there who want to host daily episodes or want to write for the website or want to do something like then then hit Hody or I up. We'll get you involved. Hody really runs the research team, the daily hosts, and and helps put that stuff together. Uh, so send one of us a message, and we'll get you plugged in. So, uh, which that leads us to Bill Weld. And uh, if you skipped ahead, which I don't blame you, uh, you 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 missed a little bit of a setup about who We Are Libertarians is. There's some folks out there who are mischaracterizing both us and also our 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 comments, my comments on Bill Weld, which surprisingly went viral. Uh, I didn't feel that I had a very offensive take, and and it really wasn't an offensive take. It got. Uh, fourteen hundred shares on Facebook, almost fifteen hundred shares on Facebook. Uh, so. At least you're not, not shadow banned. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, but let's start with who Bill Weld is. Who wants to take who? Who is Bill Weld? Harry doesn't know who Bill Weld is. Just this he, guy, you know. He's our re- her resident anarcho capitalist. Uh, Reinhold, who is Bill Weld? Bill Weld is a former uh, governor of Massachusetts, mm-hmm. two-time governor, and. Um, So I guess from that point on, he uh, ran for governor of New York at one point in 2006. He he was denied ambassadorship to Mexico mm-hmm. by Jesse Helms because he was pro legalized marijuana and pro gay marriage, okay, uh, which was a no no for Republicans back in the day. Right. Uh, then after the 2006 uh, governor race went horribly wrong, and he was treated so badly by the GOP, he just left politics for ten years. What and happened then, with the what happened with the low with the LP in New York? Because I hear this criticism of yeah. Bill Weld and the the New York LP all the time. I know they so, have fusion voting. Yeah, they had fusion voting. They were going to vote. Uh, he was going to be on the ballot for Republican and Libertarian. Mm-hmm. And he told the Libertarian Party that if for some reason he didn't get the Republican nomination, he would still do the Libertarian nomination. Right. Then the the way he was treated by the GOP there was so bad, and there were threats made against his family and he was there was a lot of back room deals and things that happened that uh still haven't been let out in light of day uh but he he got so frustrated and disgusted by it he just walked away went to europe and said i'm done and he stepped away from politics for 10 years but he didn't tell the libertarian party he was doing that he was just so frustrated he left and that put a big yeah, he he kink in what they were doing. He and, screwed yeah. them over. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way. Like, not not 
letting them know was a big was no, a big yeah. fu. But and he has apologized for that. But yeah, that, so that is something I will put this in the in the show notes. But we actually recorded his speech to Indiana last year, uh, the Indiana LP, and in it, I. I learned a few things. I heard his further context on a lot of the things that we'll talk about, some of the more con- controversial things like that, uh, about his gun comments, his Hillary comments. And I would just say to you, like, if you're at all interested in this topic, <laughs> and I know that this is probably a little too inside baseball as a topic for what we normally do here anymore, um, but – I think it is basically human nature and how we interact in groups, which is kind of what we'll, we'll dive into. Uh, but this is a, is a case study. And so, you know, I saw so many people, and this is my frustration. I'm not a Bill Weld supporter. And after seeing him speak in Indiana, I learned two things about Bill Weld. First, once you hear the further context around all the things that you see in the memes and the conversation around Bill Weld, he got kind of a raw deal. He was, he was misunderstood, and it's because of the second thing that I learned. He's, an, he's not a skillful politician. He's not a good politician. He is, uh, he is a wonk. He understands issues really well. Uh, he was good for the Johnson ticket in that he brought a lot of contacts and policy. He was the only one on that ticket that actually knew who he would staff a cabinet with. You know, Gary just seemed to not understand, you know, if he got elected, what would he do? He had no clue. It was, it was mystifying. Uh, but I learned it through that convention last year that Bill Weld was going to be Ron Nielsen 3.0. It was going to be another bad campaign run by a failed uh, campaign strategist. It was going to be run by somebody who didn't understand the broad strokes or really the overarching view he, he was still a new libertarian even after four years of work, three years of work. He, and new libertarians don't understand the overarching messages of libertarianism and the hope part of it. Mm-hmm. They understand the change part. Newer libertarians understand what they want to change. They understand that if I agree with this set of issues that I'm a libertarian, if I agree with these, I'm not. Like, they, under, they, tick, they know the tick boxes, but they don't understand, they have not yet, and it takes a long time for somebody to change their brain, their worldview, their belief system. Um, but Weld had not yet achieved a level of understanding of a vision for, a libertarian vision for the United States. And so I would not have supported him in 2020 because I did not think that he was going to be a good politician or he was going to really represent us in a way that I liked. So mm-hmm. I don't know how many of you, you three agree with that. Um, you know, anytime you have a conversation like we're about to have you, I've been called a weld lover, a weld supporter. You're automatically assumed if you defend Bill Weld in any way, shape or form that you support Bill Weld. And that's not, that's part of the problem <laughs> is that you can't have an honest conversation about somebody who is a lightning rod without you being tarred and feathered with a certain belief system. And it's, and There's it's no ir- nuance. And it's ironic that he's a lightning rod because he's the most non-lightning rod person. I mean, he, he says <laughs> so, so many things. Boring. <laughs> well, he's boring, but what, what, what he does is he thinks about topics and he goes, okay, here's, here's the thing and here's what we believe in, but there's also this you need to think about and this. And he, so he takes all these things into consideration and he verbalizes all that. And then when he's doing that, the people who want um, their evangelical, this is how it should be, are listening for little key words. And he said this, and he said that. Therefore, he is a gun grabber, and he is a, uh, you know, just so many different things that they're not listening to what he's saying. They're listening for ways, for reasons to not like him. Right. Hody, what are your thoughts on Bill Weld as a candidate? Are you a Bill Weld lover? So I am, uh, uh, he probably would not have been in my top three choices. Um, and I'm pretty clear about that. Here's the thing about Bill Weld. I'm not even necessarily done with who Bill, Bill Weld is. I probably should have jumped in right off the bat. I just was like, oh, I'm sure these guys are going to talk about this for a long time. Uh, <laughs> he started off as an attorney that prosecuted public corruption. And he was really good at it. Uh, in fact, uh, so did that for about, this is in the eighties, but did that for, uh, five, six years, he ended up resigning, um, when 
when he was uh, in the Department of Justice Criminal Division, he ended up resigning in an ethics scandal because he wasn't allowed to access the information um, against his own attorney, his own attorney general. It was within his own division. And he mm -hmm. said, there's an ethics scandal against him. He's hiding it. He has the legal authority to keep it all from us. And I'm not going to be a part of this farce anymore. So that's something that I liked about the guy. Uh, a lot of people don't remember this because it's such a different era now. But in uh, 1997, when he, he actually withdrew from being governor in order to try, he was, he was expected to be appointed the ambassador to Mexico by Bill Clinton, even though he was a Republican at the time. And uh, one of the social conservatives for Clinton, Jesse Helms, actually like released a whole bunch of trash talk on him and said he'd be terrible because he's so liberal on social issues, because he's so nice to gay people and he won't, he won't stand for our, you know, anti- The whore thing. Well, yeah. yeah, right? Well, and, and, and so- the fact, the fact that Mexico is where all the drugs were coming in, so him being pro-marijuana was another uh, right. issue too. But Absolutely. Right. And so just by, I mean, those are the biggest two achievements of his career. And those are very libertarian things, prosecuting problems within the legal and political system, especially the scandals and the corruption, which he was good at. So you should like that. And his other biggest achievement is almost being, I guess, the, the uh, ambassador to Mexico, which he didn't get because he was too nice to gay people and too good on marijuana. Well, and well, so, this is well, a guy who should be a libertarian. I guess it's, and that's the funny thing is that he always felt that he was a libertarian because he had read Hayek when he was you know younger. He started when he first got elected. He started his you know acceptance speeches fellow libertarians. He thought he was a libertarian, and what happened was is he didn't realize because he hadn't been spending time with libertarians for so, for all this time. <laughs> mm -hmm. He didn't realize what libertarians were saying and thinking in the in the right words and phrases and things that he right. needed to say he didn't understand the, he didn't understand yeah. the movement he, yeah he didn't understand that so when he he came in thinking okay you know because gary johnson asked him to come run with him so he's like yeah that sounds great I, you're doing it i'll do it and he came in and was just i think hit in the face really fast with uh-oh i know? i, I yeah. think I think he thought about it like, and this is sort of what I, I wrote in an article for the website, uh, which I'll kind of break down, you know, so, so hopefully you kind of understand who Bill Weld is. He, he ran in 2016 with Gary Johnson. He said a few things that, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend. And I was, uh, I was, I was pissed about then. Uh, and then he gave further clarification. I was like, okay, eh, I kind of see where he's coming from. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that. He's at, he's trying. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so you can go and actually listen to that speech. If you like, we're not going to sit here and argue the gun comments or, or the Hillary stuff. Uh, let him do that. It's not my job to give you, if you, you can hear directly from the man. And I got into arguments with people like this one guy. I mean, and I don't mean this to be derogatory. Um, I mean this in, a very strict sense he might have been autistic because he just he was so dogged on the point of do you agree or disagree that bill weld wanted you to vote for hillary clinton i said i don't think that i was mad about what he said at the time new information came to light and i think that if you listen to his explanation you you go okay well it's gone from Yes, Hillary Clinton is a serious candidate, and what Trump is saying is ridiculous, mm -hmm. because at that point he was the Trump attack dog, and Hillary, you know, Gary was the Hillary attack dog. Right. You know, Hillary is a serious candidate, and Mr. Trump is wrong, is what he meant. And somehow the game of telephone over three years has turned into Bill Weld supported Hillary Clinton. Well, endorsed her is what endorsed what her. Like it's it, and so I look at that and I go, libertarians have to be the most intellectually rigorous, and we are the we have our own version of NPCs. Correct. Yeah, they've got NPCs. It's a whole bit different culture and lexicon that you have to follow, or you're just on that side of the fence, and oh, yeah. you will always be on that side. Right. And, and and no one can define that, and that's the worst part is that nobody can say, okay, these are all the things that I can check the boxes off on and say, okay, I'm I'm a libertarian. You can't get me on anything because they'll find something. Right, because everybody has their own idea of what pure libertarianism is. 
They right. all want purity. They all want principle, but it's how they define it individually. So it changes from person to person. So you're never going to achieve that. Yeah. I don't think anybody has joined the libertarian party or the broader libertarian movement at the beginning and, and 10 years later been the same. Right. Like you don't, you intellectually don't start right. where you began. Nobody should be like that in life anyway. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, <laughs> right. If, if you're sitting there saying that I've got it all figured out, mm -hmm. You don't, and you're never going to if you don't get out of that mindset. But the guy just, like, I literally went back 30 times on the post. Yeah. I was just like, listen, if you listen to this and you come to a different conclusion based on the same evidence, then that's fine. We can walk away and disagree. Mm -hmm. But if you just won't listen to this explanation and hear his information because you're just so hell-bent on just believing the conversation around Bill Weld, then I don't have anything left to say to you because if you're not willing to actually deal in, like if you're not willing to let new information maybe inform your opinion about someone, then that's just intellectually backwards. Like I just can't, I have found since Trump libertarians, and I think maybe it's because there's a lot of new libertarians. Like if you go and look at our big, we have 91,000 likes. Like if you go look at our page, the comments are just brutal. Like it's yeah. just, and I think Bill Weld has, has surfaced a lot of the worst behaviors. And so my post was never meant to be a defense of Bill Weld, but a critique of how we, a, a critique of our culture yeah. <laughs> within the movement. And, and it and was it, not taken that way by a lot of people. And that's the problem is that people aren't even reading what you, they say Bill Weld and they're like, and they go. They don't even yeah. read what you said. Right. Yeah, that's what I was noticing on the comments of it. It's like, wow, they didn't read any of this. No. They, didn't, they just started a comment. They copied and pasted us from other arguments or arguments they were having in other places and just continued them in the comment yep. section. Exactly right. I want attention for my, for my nonsense. And I just, like, that frustrates me to no end because I just don't get, like, I think we've all done it. We've all posted something without reading it or we've all commented mm -hmm. on something without reading mm -hmm. the article. But like when it comes to Bill Weld, that's just like, so let me, let me read a portion of what, what I wrote. You can find it at weirdlibertarians.com. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, Bill Weld's experience with the Libertarian Party is all too common. Uh, there's a cycle that I've noticed that I articulated in this. And it is that a person has libertarian-leaning beliefs. Somebody like Bill Weld has... The, the, the vague notion that he's a libertarian because he has those issues that he seems to not agree with his party on. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, Tulsa, I'm a Tulsi Gabbard, Glenn Greenwald liberal, and I don't fit in with the Hillary corporate Democrats. Right. I'm, a, I'm a Bill Weld Republican who, who is pro-marijuana, pro-gay marriage. I disagree on some of these bigger issues. I, I have some non-interventionist beliefs. I really like Rand Paul. Maybe I'm a libertarian. And so they then dip their toe into the party and they initially feel excited because the party is aligned with their beliefs. And because it's such a small culture, the next thing that always happens, almost always, is they want to get involved in the party so they join leadership. You know, in Bill Weld's case, he looks at his resume, the party looks at his resume, Gary Johnson looks at his resume let's promote you to leadership before you really are ready for it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think there's anybody who would agree. I, I personally don't like if I had been a delegate, I probably would have voted for Bill Weld because Gary Johnson wanted him as his running mate. Mm -hmm. He made this speech and he said, listen, like you can't think about why the libertarian party pick Bill Weld. Like if all these people hate him, how did Bill Weld get selected? And I told somebody in our Facebook group, I said, it's because the people who actually go to conventions and vote are not Facebook libertarians. Right. Those Facebook libertarians who are always mad, they're never doing anything. They're mm -hmm. just commenting on Facebook. The right. people who are actually making decisions in the party, the thousand delegates that show up to vote, these are the people who are involved in the party and really don't give a fuck about Facebook arguments. They just don't. Yeah, the Facebook argument aren't the people who are donating, mem uh, donating members. Right. They're not going to the meetups. They're not doing right. that. Yeah, they're a completely different branch. Right. And so instead of looking at it like why they pick Bill Weld, you have to look at it in the context of that particular convention in those few days. You have to look at the other candidates. Like uh, Gary Johnson was a terrible choice. Okay, who is the other choice? 
Austin uh, Peterson. Wh- but those people, people, if you ask who was the who was the best choice in 2016 for the Libertarian Party, they will inevitably say, you know, The Rock, or they'll <laughs> Daryl W. Perry. Yeah, but, <laughs> even for 2020, they're like, okay, who should be president? Who should be our candidate? And they're like, well, we should go get this person, and we should right. go get that. That's 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 politics fantasy. Is, politics is the art of the possible. Yeah. And so when you look at that convention, a lot of people didn't feel at that time that Austin Peterson was ready. And I think Austin Peterson would be ready now, but he has no desire to run for president as a libertarian because right. of his experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you had Daryl W. Perry, who is ideologically, I think, what most libertarians, the person that the most libertarians would agree with, so including pure. myself. So he's pure. very pure. But stylistically, he is not, he, he's just not good in terms of uh, he's not going to get a lot of interviews. It, the, the, the wing of the party who's crying, we need purity, we need purity in our next candidate, don't remember Michael Badnarik mm-hmm. and how little attention Michael got. I like yeah. Michael a lot. I, I've met him a couple times. His constitution class is amazing. But Michael Badnarik was a he nobody knew. who got no attention. He got, he, got, he, got, he got press for doing an interview, a radio interview that said, uh, he didn't have a driver's license, and everybody right. mocked him for that. Right. And when he got arrested with the Green candidate, candidate Green Party candidate at the uh, debates, no major news media covered it. Right. It was on all the saw side stuff that you could find. Right. You, you, and so this is crazy. So when you're when you're involved in politics, like if you're an anarchist and your purity is your highest value, like if you're Harry. You don't get involved in the Libertarian Party because you know if I run for office or I get elected office, it's go- it's it's an oxymoron. Right, and that's yeah. that's the that's the argument I keep hearing from, and we've had this conversation, you know, for decades. I mean, go back to the '80s, but what I keep hearing is we need to have, if, you know, we're not going to get the person's not going to get elected as president. We need to have a a, a pure candidate out there getting the message out so that we can grow the party and right. and everything. And I said, yeah, but if that person is not considered um, legitimate by the media, you're n- nobody's going to ever hear anything I have to say. Yeah. Right. So what do you gain? So at like, that point? why do you not get involved in the party? Well, all right. So there's re I see nothing really to, I don't really see what I could gain from it other than uh, another meeting to do (laughs) and more work Uh, i also you know voting really you know no one really voted themselves into more freedom Mm -hmm. and uh i just i just don't see any benefit for me that i couldn't get out of it now that's not to say that i still think what they're doing is okay it's not it's nice i go in and i cast a quote unquote vote for them but because I like having the libertarian party having ballot access because it allows people to come to the ideas of liberty which I eventually can eventually push them off the cliff into the anarchy land right you know so I you know do that part so there's really to in my mind only two purposes to the libertarian party it is to gain exposure for the libertarian message mm-hmm. or it is to win elections yeah. and actually start influencing policy and the reality is that if you are uh, if you are on the most extreme part, in, and I, I shouldn't say extreme, I'd say if you're a person who is who believes in a stateless society, and you you know you're um, like I'm trying to think of somebody who I just think puts it in terms that uh, who, who's a good avatar. Like I want to say Chris Cantwell back in the day, but but I think somebody like um, maybe Larkin Rose. Uh, Hody, you're you're way more plugged into the movement at this point than I am. But like, uh, you're just and you're gonna have to jump in when you have something to say. Ho, ho, yeah, no problem. Well, you're kind of ignoring him. For a while. Yeah, well, that's the pro- <laughs> that's why I never really have people on the on the Skype because that's why I put the monitor in here so we can see Hody so we don't forget him. But um, I, I just think that if you're Roger Paxton, let's choose Roger. Okay. All right, because Roger's a friend and he won't he he already hates me and so he won't get mad if I pick on him. Matter uh, right. Right, because everybody knows our shtick. So I think if you're a Roger and your goal is to either educate people about libertarianism or get elected to office, uh, the way that Roger presents the message is really, in my mind, good for people who already understand the message. Yep. 
And I think your voting public just mm-hmm. doesn't really resonate with the way it, that maybe Roger puts the message. Right. It's for people who are already involved in, in the movement or it's people who are easily brought in. So there's, right. there's per- personalities and people who are really close and, and they can be easily swayed by the message. Yeah. Hmm. But it's going to be five, 10% of the people. In, it's in, not going to be in Christian terms. Majority. There's evangelism and there's edifying the faithful. And right. I see a lot of what a lot of libertarian podcasters do is edifying that you're building knowledge. You're strengthening mm-hmm. the movement. You're, mm-hmm. But in terms of evangelism, maybe you're not necessarily a good evangelist. It's a different skill than being a teacher. And so, go ahead. Well, I was, I was going to say, but because the thing is, like, the, to me, I've always saw the purpose of the Libertarian Party is not to grow the Libertarian message. That's not their purpose to me. I always thought that was silly. Right. I think the message should take care of itself. And you should try, They should probably just work on doing what a political party should do, grow the party to get elected. And this right. is what I've always said is that, okay, we have the choice between the two. Why would we not do the one thing? So there's only one political party. You know, there's how many think tanks, podcasts, Mm -hmm. websites, all trying to get the message out there for libertarianism. Why do we just need, why do we want just another one of those and give up having the one single political party out there trying to get people elected? The political influence. Correct. That's all it's meant to do. Because if you want to grow the message, do a podcast. You already got one. Cool. Awesome. All right. Now with the party, get elected. Right. So your choice as a delegate in 2016, the only people who had support, like Daryl W. Perry, didn't have the support. So your choices were uh, Mac, John McAfee, who we all can clearly see is insane. You, you, you love him? <laughs> yeah, he's going to build the firewall and make the hackers pay for it. Right. <laughs> you know, who would embarrass everyone who is a libertarian. Because realistically, when you're running for president as the Libertarian Party candidate, you are the de facto representative of libertarianism in most of our normie friends' lives. And that's why it's an important position and why I always say to people, like, why wouldn't you go get involved, join the Mises Caucus, run somebody that you feel is ideologically more libertarian, you know, because in... in Build up better candidates. Right, nobody talks to me about libertarianism until the 2020 elections yeah. and they start asking about our candidate. Like, that's when people really care. And so... Your choices were John McAfee, who was not a choice in my mind. Mm. It was Austin Peterson, Mm. who I felt was green at the time. And then it was Gary Johnson, who had done a pretty decent job in 2012 of of representing the party. He got some press attention. And he was poised as a person with experience in the minds of our normie friends who might vote. uh, And he was successful. He yes. got 3% instead of 1%, which the party had always gotten. Well, yes. less than 1%. 1% was, was right. high watermark. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, people like Bad and Eric, he got like, he came in fourth. Right. And got like 0.3% of the, of one, you know, 0.3 of 1%. So, and Gary Johnson, I felt was, fell short in terms of looking like a viable option. And so if you, if you have Gary Johnson up there, who's your only real choice in 2016 mm-hmm. for president, saying, I don't want to run for president if I don't have my team, and Bill Weld is part of that team. Nobody knew who Larry Sharp was at the time. That mm-hmm. He did so well in that debate mm-hmm. the night before that he yeah. impressed people, but like nobody knew him. So people always do good in like those debates because those debates are really not right. usually put together very and, well. And, and yeah. what you have to understand about the people who are voting, these are people who have been involved in the party for 40 years, 50 years, People as young as me who have been involved in 10 years who gave up a marriage for this fucking party. Like, you just go, these are people who have invested a lot of time, money, and energy, and they're not going to let somebody who is too green or too crazy or too untested have control of the biggest microphone that the party has every four years and a lot of ballot access depends. There's a lot of candidates on the ballot because Gary Johnson got 3%. And that's the thing I try so to they're point not, out. So they're not going to vote for somebody who yeah. isn't going to protect their investment. So you get that ballot access. You just saved millions of dollars that we have to hemorrhage <laughs> right. every four right. years yeah. for that ballot access. Now we don't have to spend it on that. We can spend it on candidates, other mm-hmm. candidates, down ballot stuff it's right so in that context and let me finish this point and then i'll open it up to harry and hody uh you know somebody like a bill weld comes along they have libertarian leaning beliefs they want to they feel excited about the prospect of getting involved in this party they want to get involved in leadership because usually somebody who is 
more qualified or experienced in politics, the higher they go in terms of we're so desperate for anyone to like us that we'll just put anybody in leadership. Sometimes it's literally who who's left to put into leadership. And so here's a guy in the, in the context of the 2016 choice, he was the choice for vice president for the delegates who paid to be there, who paid to vote and participate in the party business. And so who are all of these people who have the, the nerve to not have even been involved, to not have shown up? Like it's one thing if you went and you voted against Bill Weld and you were consistent, but it's another thing to not know how the process works and be critical because at the end of the day, for the delegates, Bill Weld was the only choice. He was the reasonable choice. Was he everybody's first choice? Absolutely not. We could all sit here and go, you know, I'd like Ron Paul and Rand Paul and Justin Amash to run on the ticket together in a tri triumvirate. Like th those fantasies don't exist. And so in the context of that particular choice, that's why Bill Weld was chosen. And so in hindsight, he looks like a bad choice. But in that in the context of that weekend, that's why he was selected. So you never can forget that people are involved and that there's differing opinions. Well, yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of different uh, variables, but you look at what the GOP has done in the 2016. They ran a candidate, uh, not by choice, that, that much choice, but that wasn't that Republican right? as their front runner. Got elected, and they have bloomed in numbers. They've picked up people who were kind of, you know, their candidate was a loud, brosterous guy that wasn't totally Republican, but they've bumped their numbers up. So it's, it just goes to show you that you can run someone who's not close, close enough to your ideals to help grow your numbers and get more people and get people motivated. Right. Uh, it's just one of those things that's. Hodor, we, we want to get you in here. Yeah. What do you, go ahead. Dude, so, so here is my deal with Bill Weld. Uh, again, I think I'm with you guys when I just say he's not my top choice. I, I think you hit it the nail on the head. He's oatmeal. He's boring. He's just. It's not enough, and especially when you're in the Libertarian Party, you're going to have to make some waves. Now, I disagree that you have to make waves when you talk about having sex with minors and shooting up school boards and oopsie racist moments like we have with other candidates. Those are not all the same candidate, by the way, but just other candidates within the party. We get up there on the stage and it's just as easy. These same people that say, oh, yeah, because he came for our gun because, yeah, let's elect a guy who comes for our guns and who endorsed Hillary. Well, one, no, he didn't endorse Hillary. Two, he's changed his stance on guns since joining the Libertarian Party. And three, all of your guys have like racist, pedophiliac um, a, a lot of times like public intoxication problems currently, not even like in the past. And you're telling us that our guy, that Weld has too much baggage. It, it, is, <laughs> it is a that's, weird, that's ridiculous. right. It is a weird thing where we, we hold this guy to a higher standard, but not other candidates. And it's yeah. like, if somebody came from another party, I've noticed this, that like Larry, Larry Sharp can do whatever he wants because he was homegrown. He came from uh, uh, up through the ranks mm. of the party, but you know, if you came from the Republican Party, you're automatically suspect. Well, remember, I, I had people say that we should have ran Austin Peterson instead of Gary Johnson because Gary Johnson wasn't a real libertarian. I'm like, Austin Peterson didn't believe in the non-aggression right. principle. He, he, right. he uh, well, as famously. Let me let me clarify. That. Well, I, I, uh -oh, don't uh -oh. spread fake news, Reinhold. You, you're, <laughs> you're, we all know you're a liberal libertarian, yeah, but yeah. what <laughs> Austin, liberal. what Austin said was basically that the non-aggression principle is important, but we can't let, when you're, when you're looking at how the modern, he, he had a very pragmatic view. Right. Said it is a good axiom to keep us tied to principle, but at the end of the mm -hmm. day, when you're trying to craft legislation, mm -hmm. don't get so hell-bent, you, you, because you end, up, you end up removing yourself from the equation in the mind of most people. And how is that any different than what Bill Will does? I, I, I don't think it's all that different, it's, honestly. Or is it worse? I mean, it's a side group. It, it, but it, but I'm, I'm trying to point out, though, it's, it's a hypocrisy. You know, they, right. they convince themselves that this side is great and good and pure, and this side is evil, horrible, rotten, and it's us well, versus them. There's just a lot of hysteria. Yeah. I mean, Hody, yeah. I mean, Hody you, went, you debated Larkin Rose yeah. uh, with our friend Trisha Stewart. Mm -hmm. And, like, I just – I go, uh, why is Hody getting death threats? Because he had – a, a the audacity to disagree with Larkin Rose like you legitimately the hell that you went through after that debate 
I mean, I don't, I don't know all the details, but you can share as much as you want. Like disagreeing with the cult led to what for you? Word. I mean, all of them are such little people and I didn't take any of it seriously there was the threat of getting doxxed and having my public, you know, my personal life revealed. Guess what? I'm Mormon. You're not going to find anything in my past. I held, I held hands outside of marriage once. Oh no, it's going to boil me alive. You know? <laughs> like, and you can listen to the debate. Like, listen to what a monster Hody was to Larkin <laughs> in that debate. In the, it was Wall Daily in the 40s or 50s, I think. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'll put it in the show notes. Very yeah, but. No, it was, a, it was a great debate. I respect Larkin. We, he and I see eye to eye on a lot of issues. It was a simple disagreement. We disagreed about the role of voting in a society. We even disagreed about the role of voluntary voting as opposed to compulsory voting. And so it's just, you know, we're talking about these small things. I got him to even agree that referendum voting is probably a valid method of voting, which was like 90% of the battle. The only problem he had was voting for representation, which we can have some someplace else. It was a fun debate and I respect the guy and I made that clear at the end of it. But the whole time, I mean, the chat log is just full of this guy's an idiot, doesn't know how to answer a question. Dude, I have won three national championships on speech and debate. Shut the F up. Get on my <laughs> level first. What, I am you meant by F than was you fun. at debate. So if you think I'm doing it wrong, you don't know how to debate's handled. That's just a fact. And so like, like anyway, that, I mean, so, so that's just me disagreeing with little trolls online. I barely acknowledge them because they're little trolls online. And, and frankly, most of them are too stupid to get it. If, if they already come into the bait being like, oh, it's already over. I, know, I already know who won. Or you see the same person liking every person who disagrees with me status. They're NPCs. Why waste my time? They're brainless. I don't care. They're, they're, they're locked into how they're locked in. I'm interested in people who are actually interested in changing minds. But that's what Bill Weld, I'm sure was going through was this NPC crowd of just saying, you know, look, if the two things he's most famous for are taking people's guns and then regretting it and then saying, eh, I consider Hillary Clinton a more viable candidate than Trump. Eh, I, I just like that. That is not worse. Hillary Clinton got people killed and covered up their murders in Benghazi. She wasn't the murderer, but she covered them up because she right. didn't want it to look bad. That is so much worse than anything else any of the libertarian candidates have. So, yeah, I understand we're trying to pick between filet mignon and New York strip. And you can be all, all in on filet mignon. But if a New York strip comes up and you just, I can't eat this. I can't do it. Dude, grow up a little. Grow a pear, eat the steak. At least you're getting steak and not this, you know, vegan soy, whatever Harry eats, you know. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He just called you a vegan uh -oh, soy. I know, vegan. <laughs> I we, just, we just went. He just called you a soy now. boy. You're, first a, off, you're first a soy off. boy. You look at your man boob, soy boy. I like, uh, you know, he's not here, so I like, <laughs> Okay, over your New York strip. Yeah, he, he's okay. getting a little mouthy being on Zoom over yeah, here. He's on Skype and he's just he's not in reaching. His distance. little Mormon mouth is running. the The mouth from the what? What's your what should we call Hody's nickname? The Storm and Mormon. Yeah, Storm and Mormon. Oh, it's okay. I'm glad he's losing weight. He's getting into my weight class. It's gonna be great. <laughs> oh. oh, so. So this leads me to the next step in the uh, the uh, common libertarian uh, party experience. They're ripped to shreds after they join leadership. So you you have the beliefs. Hmm. Go ahead, Harry. I was going to say this real quick. Some if you guys listened to the first, early episode, I remember talking about it on my journey into libertarianism because I was always like, I, I always had more fun as a Republican because every libertarian I used to met before joining Wall. They're all dicks. I didn't yeah, care about it. It's, it's like, I agree with everything you say, but you're, everyone I've met is such a dick. I'm going to stay over here. Yeah. So it, you st the person thinks, ah, I'm kind of libertarian. They, they dip their toe in the party. They kind of investigate. They explore it a little bit, which mm -hmm. this, this got like, oh, yeah, Bill Weld dipped his toe in the party. You didn't, yeah. get to, you didn't even read to the third step, which is they want to get involved, so they join leadership, mm -hmm. usually too soon. Uh, I probably should have put that addendum on there. You have to be so literal when you're talking to libertarians. Yeah. So, which led to the fourth one, which is ripped to shreds by emotionally immature, controlling children on Facebook that can't tolerate others holding beliefs different than theirs. Same arrogant children often have zero political experience and have no desire to get involved. They say things like, this is why I left the Libertarian Party, as if they ever did a single thing to help the party in the first place. These are the cultists. These are the jihadists. These are the people who don't think with their brain. 
they just think tribally. Like what you have to understand about we are libertarians and me personally and everybody that's involved, libertarianism is not our religion. Libertarianism is, is a small part of my identity. This podcast is a piece of my identity. I'm an uncle. I'm a professional. I'm uh, a, a lover. Uh, I have, you know, I'm a Christian. I have many other pieces to my identity. And so when you criticize libertarianism, it's not the totality of my identity. It's not threatening my religion because this is not a secular religion to me. I have a religion already. Like, and so I think there are people that when they hear criticisms of libertarianism or they feel that certain people are threatening their religion or their identity, they, they treat everything as a hostile attack. And that's a very unhealthy mindset. It's a jihadist mindset. Mm -hmm. And so what I think we have in the movement is a set of jihadists, and it may be 10%, but those people are so vocal and so aggressive that 90% of the people go, there's a real problem with the Libertarian Party, but it's really like 10%. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's probably you know, 25, maybe? You're, you're, an, you're a shit poster, <laughs> Reinhold, so I don't want to hear it. But I like to push a button or two. All right. And so, uh, you know, having managed the Libertarian Party of Indiana from 2008 to 2012, uh, I can tell you there are a lot of people who followed the party, but they didn't like me because they would call me up. They would tell me their idea. Then they'd call back six months later and go, why didn't you do what I told you to do? And I go, because you weren't going to give a single minute. You weren't going to give a single dollar. And it doesn't fit into our priorities. And I told you that if you thought this was a good idea, you should do it. And you didn't like that I asked you to actually do something. And so there's one guy, Christopher Fleener, who just mother Fs me all the time. And he's one of those guys. And it's because he's an arrogant, controlling person who's a narcissist, uh, allegedly. <laughs> Probably should edit that part out. Allegedly. Uh, timestamp. Uh, yeah, let's timestamp that. You know, uh, emotional. Well, there, there are people who are, who are, who are arrogant, who are condescending, who are controlling, who are narcissists, who just think that what they tell the party to do, it ought to be done. Mm -hmm. But they personally don't. Their idea, they're the idea man. Like they're the ones who are sending the creepy messages to Trisha Stewart and Jess Mears, and like you wouldn't believe the DMs that libertarian prominent libertarian women get it is the most disgusting thing i've ever seen in my life and it's not like it probably doesn't happen to ali stuckey or the roaming millennial or whatever but there's something like, like i have attractive hoosier republican friends and they don't get these sorts of dms like the like the indiana libertarian girls do like and it's because there's just a level of the movement that is very small but is just sociopathic and well, yeah. I don't know what that is, but it's very concerning. These are yeah. people who are it, who are the ones threatening Hody. They're threatening women. They're threatening anybody who disagrees with their worldview, and they're jihadists. And we are all so nice that we don't actually go after these people. And I am not nice. I am a person who is polite until I am no longer polite. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that it's time for libertarians who are listening who disagree with this tactic and want these sociopaths to go away, it's time for you to start telling them to shut the fuck up. So it's, it's the, the Muslim community has to police their own. We have to police the libertarians who are harassing women. We have to po police the libertarians who are, go who are threatening to kill Hody and his children because he has a debate. Like, you're not welcome. Like there has to be a point where we start saying and stop being so desperate for everyone to like us because when you're desperate to be liked and desperate for anyone to join you, you let anyone join you. And then the lowest common denominator ruins your movement. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. And sometimes you have to look at people like a Melissa Donahue or a Melissa Hubbard mm -hmm. and you have to say, you're no longer welcome here. You are no longer welcome in the Indiana Libertarian Party. I'd like you to leave. And that's a very tough thing to do but at some point it has to be done mm -hmm. if we're ever going to grow as a movement. Yeah. Sounds like we need a Gillette commercial to <laughs> right. tell us how to police <laughs> right. our own. Right? You, you, you have to be, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the personal development bonus segment here, but to, 
it, it is it is good to be nice. Yeah. But at a certain point, you have to, like Jordan Peterson says, put foot down. you have to be a monster that has yourself under control. Well, it's like they did to Richard Spencer when he showed up at that yeah. conference. You're not welcome ago. here. Yeah, it's totally. He's not yeah. welcome. Yeah, you're not welcome here. Well, it's the same thing you watch on, like, a, I don't know if everyone watches any of the uh, Kitchen Nightmare stuff like that. They'll go into restaurants. They're like, well, this is the recipe that we've always used. The regulars like it. It's like, yeah, but you've got to change this recipe so we get new people in here. Right. You know, if you just want to play to these five people, go ahead. You will go now, out of business. Well, that, that's what I was talking about, too, is we, we have a message. A lot of people have this message that reaches five, ten percent of the people. But it's those people that are easily attracted to it who are right. the sociopaths, the backwards. I, I am, the, I am issues. not talking about the people that disagree with you. I am not. Like, you know, if you're involved, yeah. if you're at the level that I'm at in the libertarian movement. Right. Not trying to make myself sound important, but I do have a certain level of experience of the party that has has gained me some some following. Mm-hmm. And I know who my five people are. You know, and, and like the way that you handle it is you, you let it go a little bit. And then eventually you kind of slide in a DM and you go, Did I do something to you? Yeah. You know, or like you you give them a chance because you never know, like, man, I'm so sorry. Like I, like I'm just, I'm just playing. I just think this is fun. Like they're just not good at joking Mm -hmm. or they just lost their job or they're in the middle of a divorce. Mm -hmm. And so like they're trolling, like, like 25% of those, those five people that are always kind of consistently on your wall, shit posting, like that you just hate that are aggressive and awful. Like 25% of those people are just a struggling person that have a problem. 75% of them, when you hit them with a DM, they're just dicks. And mm-hmm. you just block them. You block them and you go, this is not, I, I don't want you in my community. It's time to move on. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I, there was a guy who I just removed from the We Are Libertarians Facebook group. It's like, you just don't, you, if I let you have control, then you ruin my community. And as much as I'm for open speech and free conversation, there has to come a point where you just say to the bad actors, you're not welcome to be here anymore because that's a core tenant of a voluntary society. You have to say mm-hmm. to some people, you're no longer welcome in this community. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's why it's, that's very important because there, you get people like that that need to go away. Right. You know, they, they come in and they don't want a community. They don't want friendships like that. They want it their way. They want to control things. You know, the ones that, that come in to do that it's almost like they want to be in charge they want their government they want to be their state but they want to be the ones on top right it's the status that everyone hates you know the status that like everything will be okay once i run things yeah bill weld is I, I, I like we said all of us not our not our top choice we don't want him to run for president the deal was is people are celebrating because he's quitting the party we were so toxic that he quit the party yeah. Well, and it, it wasn't that it was so toxic that he quit, but people were cheering it, celebrating. It yeah. Thing. So let La- me let laugh me reacts continue. only. Let me continue on with my my spiel here. So the next step is the normal person can't understand why they'd waste their time losing elections while being abused by a group of weirdos. And I can't believe people got mad at this. It's so common yeah. sense. And so the the person returns to the original party, and as I wrote. Bill Weld could have taught the Libertarian a lot because of his experience and connections in politics. The Libertarian Party could have taught him a lot about the Libertarian philosophy. Unfortunately, that didn't happen because the people in the Libertarian movement are dedicated to keeping the movement small. This was exemplified by the sniping at Weld at the recent Liberty Con event from the stage. If people are wondering why I don't recommend joining the party to friends and listeners anymore after dedicating a decade of my life to it, this cycle is why. I'm a bad friend if I knowingly waste their time and abuse them. I'll recommend candidates, but not joining party leadership anymore. Uh, we Are Libertarians creates hundreds of new libertarians a year, and it's a shame that they have no political home. And if you need any uh, validation of what I'm saying, go look at the comment section of my personal post or the We Are Libertarians post where I originally wrote this. It's full of people missing the point about building a more welcoming party and attacking Weld anyways, mixed with people sharing their own stories of ending their time in the dog kennel, Mm -hmm. which I'll explain in a moment. You know, the, you never can confuse comments with the majority opinion. When you look at the amount of likes and shares that this particular status got, it was 200 likes around there versus a bunch of comments of people missing the point. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And those, I got so many people DMing me going, I don't want to be abused, but man, that really resonated with me. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying these things because I want to be mean to people like Arvin or Roger. I'm saying these things because I want us to do a better job of looking at a Bill Weld and saying, you're wrong on some fundamental issues and here's why. As opposed to fuck him in the neck. Like, Mm -hmm. let's, you know, I just have a, I don't have a fundamental disagreement with the substance of what Roger says. We have a stylistic difference. And the problem is that I'm not allowed to have a stylistic difference because they're jihadists in the movement. Like, let's be honest. Had I Bill, have I, had I interview Bill Weld, what do you guys think would have happened? Like, what would have the response have been? I'm casually get this unsubscribe. As a person who is trying, podcast, yeah. ha, right? As a person who is trying to grow a business, could there be any bigger brand damage than having had a conversation on air with Bill Weld? It would depend. If you would have attacked him, you know, right. you would have threw the the you know the right. the stake to them. Like, well, I, know, I don't. Finally. I don't know. I mean, there's certain podcasters who can interview people like, you know, Chris Cantwell and. Steve them on you, and they seem to be doing okay. Enough of your libertarianism, but no, the, the the I think you know Adam Kokesh, you make a great point. Went yeah. after Bill Weld, but eventually, Constantly. but a- eventually, Kokesh said, "I'm going to have a conversation with the guy," yeah. mm-hmm. and they ended up liking each other. And and that, and that was the funny thing learning too from is each that other. I was really impressed with Bill Weld for putting up with so much for so long by these people, like Adam coming up and being as rude as he was. And Bill was, you know. He, he tolerated it for a little while. I mean, and he finally said, I, we're done here. But he, he was still, you know, and, and the fact that he was sitting in the convention hall during that debate for chair when his name was brought up as an epitaph and, and yeah. all that stuff, he happened to go through that and live through to that. To his face yeah, in front of right him. Right there. Like, it's just like, like. So let me continue on. Um, I, I don't mean that leadership is above criticism. I don't want you to misunderstand me because there, but I just think that there are right ways and wrong ways to do it. Weld was absolutely not ready to represent the libertarian philosophy in 2016. And it is totally unclear if he would have done it well in 2020 because we never got the chance to actually hear from him directly. And you probably wouldn't have even listened to my conversation with Bill Weld because of the amount of negative social proof that would have gone on with that. Uh, So I actually, as a person who believes in open speech, believe in telling these people to shut up because if you can't actually listen to a person or you're unwilling to listen to a person and what they say and disagree with them in a fundamental way, then you're the problem and not the weld. So there are a ton of people that are new, and this is a key, key thing that libertarians have to understand. There are a ton of people that are brand new to libertarianism because of the Johnson Weld campaign. I talk to them all of the time. At least weekly, I talked to somebody who got involved in the libertarian movement because they heard Gary Johnson speak in 2016 and they searched us on the podcast app and started listening. The reality is that audiences take things very personally. So I work for a nationally syndicated radio show with hundreds of thousands of people online. I communicate with thousands of people online a week for this particular brand and then with We Are Libertarians, hundreds. Like I can, I have spent 15 years building audiences online as a digital marketer, as a content producer. And what I can tell you in that experience is that audiences take things extremely personally. And so when you trash Bill Weld or when you trash Donald Trump or AOC in a certain way, in a, in a too harsh, too personal way, what, those, what the hearer hears is not Bill Weld is an asshole. They hear, I am an asshole. I'm not welcome. I can't be a part of this. And so the reality is that audiences, because they take things so personally, there are a lot of people that just never bother getting back involved with the party because of the way that they see Bill Weld treated. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, can, you can disagree with me, but I think if you had my experience, you would understand that I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, and I would ask some of your normie friends, like, do you not get involved because the Libertarian Party is too aggressive on Facebook? And I bet you'd hear a lot of people say yes. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of that aggression, Judd Weiss captured perfectly on Lions of Liberty. 
um, and the culture that needs to change. And he was, he was, this is months ago when he said this, but he said for the most part of the last several decades, after all this time, energy, hostility, brain distraction, emotion, the Libertarian Party hasn't really achieved anything. It's been a sinkhole in the wider liberty movement. It's been the biggest sinkhole of time, energy, money, and emotions that I've seen. It's a cage match arena where the libertarians fight with each other over positions of no power. It's embarrassing. I wish it would be improved. We need to stop focusing on the minute details of people's differences. We need to focus on improving the environment. We need to focus on improving the experience of being involved in the liberty movement and the libertarian party. Otherwise, no one's going to want to be involved in this experience because the experience is miserable. Maybe the Libertarian Party has contributed something valuable to the scene, though. Maybe the Libertarian Party's value is that it's not to win elections. It's basically the convenient quarantine pen for the most toxic elements. It's like a dog kennel. You can't have rabid dogs biting people. You need to put them somewhere, so that's the Libertarian Party. It's a place for angry Libertarians who need a chew toy, and that's each other. And I felt like I, when he said that, I went, wow, mm -hmm. boy, did he nail that. So, you know, the libertarian movement is a movement dedicated to philosophy instead of power or policies. Like the other two parties are dedicated to both policy and mostly power. And having been a libertarian for a long time, I continually discover something new about the philosophy. I, the, the libertarian philosophy is constant and I am ever changing. And so I'm constantly reading something new like a Mises or a Rothbard or a David Bowes or a study on Cato or something on fee. And I go, wow, I never really, that's why I do this show is because of the intellectual exercise of applying the principles to daily life and trying to understand something new and stretch myself. And so I'm discovering something new about the philosophy every day. And I don't think that conservatives and Democrats have that same experience. But I've only grown through reason dialogue amongst friends uh, or media outlets that I think like Fee or Cato or mostly Mises or, you know, the Tom Wood show or Jason Stapleton or Lions of Liberty. You know, these shows talk to you in a way that it talks to you on a personal level. This show, what we do is conversation amongst friends. So you feel like you're sitting at the kitchen table with us and 85 episodes and you still can't turn off the damn buzzers, Harry. Uh, so, <laughs> but the way that I have grown to understand more about libertarianism is through reason dialogue with friends, asking questions or researching from people that treat me with respect. The LP, the movement at large, and the thought leaders did a very poor job of treating Bill Weld as a friend. And either the party makes a space for competing ideas and new people an open dialogue or it dies. And so I, I think we're, we're at a point as, as a podcast where I can't recommend to you to get involved in the Libertarian Party. And I have felt this way for a year and a half. And my uh, previous co-host, Greg, continually wanted to say this on the air. And I said, you know, the reality is we've got a lot of people who are involved in the Libertarian Party listening, and I don't want them to feel hopeless. And... I think that if you are going to, because I never want to be the guy that tells you your efforts for liberty are wasted. I don't want to be that person. I want to encourage you to continually uh, spread the message of libertarianism in the way that you think is, is working for you. And I think if you're involved in your local libertarian party, if you're in Hamil you know, Henry County with our friends in the Boss Hog of Liberty crew, mm -hmm. it's a worthwhile thing to be involved in the local libertarian party. Right. It's a great way to meet people. But as a, as a movement on the whole, I have, I have found myself being less and less dedicated to the idea that the party works, that it's worth anything, and that it has become a waste of time, energy, money, and emotions. And, and I hate to say that, and this is the first time that I've said this on the show publicly, because I don't want to discourage anyone listening. If it's working for you, great. But if it's not working for you, then you need to not worry about changing it. You need to leave. You need to do something differently. And that's why I started this show. I started this show because I felt, and Roger Paxton's a great example of this. You know, I've criticized him. Now I'll say something nice about my friend Roger. Roger was involved in the Libertarian Party, and he said, this is a waste of my time. 
this is a waste of my energy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do something differently. So he started his podcast, The Lava Flow, which we promote because I want you to hear what Roger has to say. He has a different point of view and a different way of presenting that point of view than I do. And I want you to listen to it and be challenged by it. Uh, you know, he, I wish he, he, he runs our promos. He should encourage more people to listen to our show um, and be challenged by what we say. But the, the reality is that um, I have a hard time telling you to go get involved in a movement at large that I think disrespects you as just a person who may not fully understand the ideology. And uh, that bums me out. It shouldn't be that way. Maybe we should change it from the inside. But at the end of the day, I would rather you live a happy, fulfilled life that brings you joy and uh, you doing things that make you look forward to, to doing whatever that activity is instead of going to a meeting with a bunch of people who talk shit about you or talk shit about the people that you like. Like, I just don't think it's worth it. Now, that's a global assessment of the Libertarian Party. Uh, but, again, it may be individually different. Mm -hmm. um, Hody, uh, am, am I wrong in saying that? Should I have just kept this thought to myself continually for another two years? Not at all. I'm done with politics as well. That's one of the big reasons. I, I didn't know it was one of the reasons I got involved with We Are Libertarians at first. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, I'm ready to start changing, changing things a different way in America. And I'd rather join a media outlet that I feel like politics is taking a temperature. You'd say, okay, what's our temperature? Oh, okay, we're, we're 100.3. We're a little bit sick. Okay, we've been sick for a very long time. But I feel like politics is a way to take the temperature. It's okay to be passionate about taking that temperature. I'm not against that. But I feel like pushing for cultural change, societal change, talking about different things in the media, pushing for what's actually important, pushing for people to change their lives is what actually changes that temperature. I don't believe, and just by virtue of them being a political party, I just don't believe that that's the best way to change a temperature. I don't believe that's the best way to change the sickness that America has right now. You mentioned at the beginning that Dave Ramsey might be more responsible for more people's freedom just by setting them financially free than any political candidate we could get. And I completely agree because you start living a free life. The realization of that freedom, the feeling of it is much more different, than, is much better than the philosophy because we want you to live it. We're not trying to shove something down your throat. We want you to actually get there because when people are free, they think differently. L let's look at the, sl the blacks that managed to not be slaves in early American history and the amazing and astounding quotes they had and what they lent to the liberty cause because they had that freedom and that understanding and how much better they were on liberty than even the whites during that generation because they didn't take it for granted anymore. If you are in debt, you know what that feels like on your finances every month. It drags you down. And so when you are out of debt, it's a totally different mindset between somebody who's never been in debt. You know, you have this, this love for it. So what I'm saying is I, I am glad that you're saying this because I think it's something that we need to talk about. It's something that you and I need to talk about more in depth. I just am done with politics entirely. I'm done with trying to change the way I take people's temperature to try and make it look like we're okay. We're not okay. I want to be part of this network and I want to do things that change the way that people feel instead of just telling them, hey, isn't it great over here on the other side? Oh, they keep rejecting it. And that's how I feel about po libertarian politics right now. I mean, that's just it in a nutshell. This is even aside from the Bill Weld thing, which as far as people getting treated like garbage, absolutely. I mean, the Libertarian Party has lost the fight on social media as far as toxicity goes. It's just, it, it, it's, it, maybe you could think that you can claim it back, but for now it's just destroyed. And it shows up at the polls. We can, you can think you can win on social media, but it doesn't pan out. It doesn't, it doesn't really, it do, social media doesn't drive votes. It's just no. not there as a social media professional who makes a living at it. 
who has watched hundreds of candidates over the last 10 years pour money into trying to win on digital. It doesn't. It doesn't make a dent. Ask Austin Peterson how often digital translates to actual votes. It can, it can count against you. It can, it can, right. it can ruin you, but it's not <laughs> going to get you in there. Ryan Hold, you are the, probably the most staunch uh, on the panel today of people who are – you've been a longtime libertarian person. Am I an asshole? No. I mean, Harry no. says in general, but on this particular – No, no. So everybody and, – and I've seen this happen over the years is that people need to step away for a while. Yeah. Uh, from time to time. And it's healthy to do. You can't, you can't live in a constant state of outrage, arguing, uh, bickering, fighting. I mean, you have to, you can't, you have to walk away sometimes. So if you don't feel like the, what it, what they're doing is working, then you shouldn't be involved in it. But if you feel like you can contribute and change that culture, then get involved and do that because we need people in there doing that and changing it so that we can uh, make it a place where we could actually achieve something. But it's hard when you have people like when, when I'm having arguments about uh, the situation and Bill well and all that stuff, I keep getting told that 2016 was an abject failure for the libertarian party. And I can't figure out how they can come to that in their conclusion. And their head. mathematically, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. And they're like, well, we should have got more. We should have had this and we should have had that. I'm like, that was never going to happen. What experience are you basing? I want exactly. I want people to ask those people, what experience are you basing this on? Because right. as a like paid professionals who work in politics go, wow, that was a really good year for the libertarians. Right. Like I, well, my, my colleagues would come up to me and go, Gary did a great job. Here's what they think. They think that, well, we had the two most hated candidates ever, which I don't think is true because I think there's been some pretty nasty ones back in the early part of the country. But um, so, so we had that big polarization going on and 60% of the people wanted somebody else and we had somebody else and why didn't he win? Because he didn't capture the, the, those 60% of the people. I'm like, you're not understanding politics. If that race between... Uh, Trump and Clinton had not been close. Johnson gets 10%. Right. Easy. But it wasn't. It was close. Right. It was so close that people were like, oh, I really want to vote that way, but I can't. I got to go vote for this person because I don't want the other person getting in. Right. And that's what drove the fact that he got 3% in that environment, I thought was very impressive. Right. Now, if he had got on the ba- if he had got on the debate stage, right, at the time he was – uh, at the debates were coming around, he was at 12%, maybe 13, 15, depending on the polls. Some of them were manipulated a little bit, but Trump and Hillary were only in the twenties, upper twenties. Right. So he gets on the bait stage with them. He takes 5% from each of them. Now we're a dead, even race. At that point, people are going, he can win. Mm-hmm. And then they'll start, they, they could, they would have started funneling him. That's why he was kept out of the debates. That's why the, the NBC and, and I think ABC both put out polls that were supposed to be um, what, you know, the four determiners. Right. Mm-hmm. They put out polls that didn't ask anybody under the age of 40 <laughs> who they were going to vote for president. Right. So, I mean, that's not really very accurate, right? So they, but they didn't want him on there for that reason because they knew it was going to call it, it could have cost them. It, right. It could have disrupted the election. Yeah. They didn't want another um, Ross Pro. Yeah. Right. Any thoughts? Um, let's see. I think um, you can save it for your final thoughts. I was going to say we have to just thought we hit it on the head that you are an asshole. But uh, <laughs> we're all in agreement. <laughs> we're, it's on tape. It's on, re- on recording. You know. But yeah, but and, and you, you're absolutely correct because I think because when Johnson ran in 2012, no one said it damn thing about me about gary johnson we had 2016 uh yeah people were like can you tell me about gary johnson wall put out wall put out a gary johnson podcast in both elections and i would basically go to youtube and rip the audio and put it onto a podcast feed so when people search gary johnson he'd pop up Mm -hmm. and maybe they'd find their way back to where libertarians and i must have posted 20 or less in all of 2012 for gary johnson and Mm -hmm. probably half of those were media interviews where he was in indiana Yep. And I just had access to the audio. Mm-hmm. I was posting five, at least five a week, every single week, every single, all 52 weeks in 2016. Mm-hmm. It was insane. The amount of 
content that that his interviews were producing. And the other thing too is that you know part of the part of the sell at the convention was that um, the polling companies and the media would would help you know promote. They would include him in the polls. They would promote uh, the mm-hmm. ticket because. Uh, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld together, that's a force. That's a legitimate candidate right, right there. And when you go look at, so on Reddit, somebody put out a, a Reddit uh, site and it was under the Gary Johnson thing, but it was a list of every single interview he did on TV, him and, and Bill Weld. Um, and there were five a day, six a day, seven, mm-hmm. eight, just for months. You can go back and look at those. And it was just like so much media attention, so much getting that message out. That's why people started hearing. I, I had family that I don't talk politics with at all coming up and me and going, who's this Gary Johnson guy? I, I, I kind of like what he's saying. Politics is the only thing that matters in politics and winning an election is name ID. Like if yeah. you're running for office, you need to understand the only thing that matters is name ID. That's yeah. why we ran Rupert in 2012. He had a 50 percent name ID in Indianapolis mm-hmm. and it gave us the biggest electoral statewide vote count we'd ever had but it right. wasn't it wasn't a landslide but it was big right. and, and when i say to people who are like well we should run someone principled great let's get people who are principled let's get them built up as candidates let's work to make them the same name recognition as you have with these other people and it's hilarious to me when people are saying well we we need to run this person or that person it doesn't matter if they have any media attention or anybody knows who they are we'll get that no, you when won't. when yeah. when you've got um, was it a uh, I can't remember her name now Amy Klobuchar yeah mm-hmm. running and people and the same people are saying who's she she's not going to win nobody knows who she is right she's got more political cred than anybody on on the Libertarian Party now that if yeah. Bill decides to leave and go be run I, for president I find I find it to be two distinct people in the Libertarian movement or the Libertarian Party specifically. I, I think the people who, like, I think people, like, I came up by talking to friends. Mm-hmm. Like, I learned libertarianism by talking to people and working things out and conversing in this way, you know, with some reading, obviously. But there are a lot of people who were alone in a room reading Murray Rothbard. Mm-hmm. And that's how they discovered libertarianism. And so I think sometimes the people who are alone in their room reading mistake that that's the way that everybody learns about this stuff Mm. and so you you don't understand that the way that you learn may not be the way that everybody learns and i just think it is a bit of self-absorption it's part of our culture at large not just libertarians Mm -hmm. in that we think that we think that because the way that we think is just the way that everybody else thinks or the way we should think yeah right so i think it's inevitable that when you talk to those some of these people you go how'd you how'd you become a libertarian the more social people that make up like we are libertarians will go, oh, I was talking it through with friends mm-hmm. uh, or I listen on a podcast. And then there are the people who are much more serious, like Roger mm-hmm. read in the room where they read books, you know? Yeah, and so, right. And so they have a much more intellectual thrust than maybe the more social thrust that we do, the more sales side mm-hmm. versus the more data side. Like I, so and I think there's places for all of it. It's just that you've got to let the Rogers of the world, like Roger promotes me and we do a podcast together because Roger understands not everybody's me. Like Roger, I'm picking on him, but Roger gets it. Like otherwise Roger and I wouldn't, like I genuinely care for Roger and I think he's a good dude. Like we just have disagreements on the style, but you know, the Rogers of the world, the black and yellows have to just understand that, some people like to talk things out loud and yeah. get, to, get to new conclusions. Like, you can't call them idiots for not understanding what you un- – don't you fucking read me? So well, no. Someone handed me human action, and I screamed in horror that it was a 1,000 pages. Mm-hmm. And I have four kids, and I have a job, and I don't have time for that. Can you just mm-hmm. explain it to me in a reasonable way that is respectful and treats me like I'm a human being and not just a fucking stupid idiot? So – um, I want to I want to wrap up by reading Arvin Vora, who is running for president, has taken a lot of heat from for a lot of things. Um, we interviewed him at the convention. We interviewed him at the convention. I think he's an intelligent person with something to say. I don't think he's, uh, but I definitely think that he's on the other end of the style spectrum compared to me. Uh, and he responded to my post. 
thank you, Reinhold, uh, for posting my article in the in the radical chat. So that <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> so I thought it was. Uh, that day didn't get ruined. Uh, so Arvin writes, uh, We Are Libertarians podcast has been griping, which is a total misrepresentation, a gr has been griping that people who hold non-libertarian views, such as Bill Weld's view that those on no-fly lists should, be, should lose their right to buy guns, often get attacked by libertarians. Um, that's... I don't think that that's what I was saying. I wasn't saying that uh, I was griping that we should leave non-libertarian. I mean, maybe I kind of am, but uh, well, there's a way to go about it. And right. He it's he's setting it up so yeah. his comment section and his audience would love sure. what was coming. Do you attack the person or do you attack the view? Right. I mean, it's just that that's griping that we save him from that criticism. No, griping that we save him from a character assassination. Absolutely. But, but I want to read Arvin's thing because I think it's, he does make a valid point here. As someone who started out moderate and then gradually became more libertarian, I've had a different experience. When I was a moderate, I routinely said non-libertarian things. I supported government-funded charter schools and vouchers, for example, and was mostly supportive for this welfare status view. I talked about the fair tax and was cheered on. Later, when I adopted actual libertarian views, my experiences were quite different. When I talked about abolishing public schools, a basic tenet of minarchism, anarchism, and a part of the LP platform, I was attacked and derided. I don't mind being attacked on anarchist principles that differed from minarchist ones. I get that anarchist and minarchists often have. Minarchist is basically like constitutionalism. Like think of the United, the original founding, uh, some level of a state government. Um, have a different view on open borders, public roads, government involvement in an age of consent, government-run courts. I expect there to be disagreements there. Um, I don't get how he gets the open borders thing because that's different. But anyways, at, but being attacked for minarchist views like abolishing government schools felt, feels a bit absurd. And I, the only one, has anyone else been attacked by libertarians for minarchist, not anarchist views? And then a bunch of people said, yeah, I get attacked every day for it. Um, but now, the, the problem with what Arvin is saying is the way that Arvin has articulated those particular points by saying, let's shoot the cops, let's yeah. shoot the let's It's shoot, not, it's let's not that he teachers. has those like, positions, it's how he's messaging I, I, them. And, and I want to be fair, I don't think he said shoot cops. Like, that's yeah. probably, that's a misrepresentation, but yeah. he, has, okay. he has said, like, very aggressive things that turned a lot of people off and people were very the timing doing it like doing things on yeah. veterans day that it, irritated veterans and things like that when he was the vice chair of the party yeah and so it's the exact you know so that's why he got pushback it wasn't for his views yeah. it was for the way that he said what he said right. on the days that he said it in the context that he said it and that's mm -hmm. what we've been trying to get across to arvin and he's just like no i'm here to employ no him. he believes that that's the right way to go because he gets more he, he'll get all this hate and everybody will share his content and he'll get reach more people. Right. Which kind of happened because all these, all these people were like, I can't believe what he said. Look what he said here. And start sharing it everywhere. And I'm like, you're, why are you doing that? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. Right. So, uh, but I wanted to give the other side of that. All right. Final thoughts, Hody, final thoughts for the episode. So I, I have respect for the people that do it the reading way that you talked about. They read the, the, the higher intellectual, the Mises, the Bastiat, the Rothbards, you know, that they get really into it that way. I want to say as somebody who loves intellectual discussion that those intellectuals oftentimes disagree with each other. You had Hayek, Bastiat and Mises all disagree on how monetary supply should work and it almost destroyed her party. And just because they had these sim simple little disagreements, all three of those guys are pretty much on the Mount Rushmore of libertarianism now because we realize it doesn't really matter, right? It's monetary supply. It's a small subject that most people don't even understand. So just because you're like, well, I'm well read, so I came to this one libertarian point. No, you didn't. Because the thing is, is there's 18 different libertarians with 
18 different points, even if you're reading all the super smart high up ones. You're just going to pick the ones that you agree with the most and go from there. So you should not belittle people that, and this even includes myself, and I love reading and I'm a well-read guy and I'm a well-learned guy, but the way I got to the libertarian philosophy is by saying good ideas and bad ideas. And my good ideas didn't get corrected, my bad ones did. And eventually I just was like, okay, I think I, I know how to say good ideas and I'm, you know, but, but even then I still say something that's controversial. Maybe I've been thinking about this a little bit and I get it honed and it gets, and it comes back towards that Liberty direction. Look, if libertarianism is the correct philosophy, you don't have to harass people out of it. You don't have to slam them or make fun of them or assassinate their character because it will win because simply you state the idea. How, how do you, how do you like, you may not have a gun to somebody's head, but how do you argue for, argue for non-aggression by using aggression? That, right. That, that's, I, I'm going to be hostile towards you. I mean, you know, we got the NAP. Oh, I won't physically assault you, but get ready for this brutal verbal assault I'm going to give you. And it's like, well, look, the, the whole point of liberta libertarianism, it's not anti-government. It's not anti-state. It is pro liberty it's a maximum amount of liberty the goal is to have a world set free in our lifetime that's that's i believe the motto right and so we say well, you should love liberty the non-aggression principle it shouldn't be something holding you back it shouldn't be like oh i can't physically slug this guy but i'd love to do it this is something that you should love to do it's something that you should embrace you should say well of course i wouldn't assault the guy i love the guy Guess what? If you continue to be an a-hole, you kind of prove why people think that some government is needed because they say, well, you've already proven to me that only because you aspire to this non-aggression principle will you not hit Bill Weld in the face. All right. So obviously you need some kind of rule that says, hey, you can't hit people in the face. So you need to be a loving, caring, nurturing person. People that, like me that are highly on the intellectual and non-emotional side still came to this place by having our ideas corrected and usually by people we care about and not by people threatening to dox me and kill me. I mean, those people in, in the debate that threatened to kill me and threaten my family, I, I don't pay them any credence. I, I don't even know what they said. You know, as soon, I stop as soon as I say, as they say, oh, I'm going to Utah, I'm going to find where, where you live and kill you. And I'm like, okay, well, I better make sure my guns are loaded. You know, I, I don't look and say, well, why is this person intellectually upset with me? So when you're all angry about Bill Weld, or what, you can dislike the guy. We have plenty of disagreements. Chris, you are one of his biggest critics on this show. Like we are not, it's funny to take this hard stance, but it feels like that of Voltaire. We you say, I'll, you know, and I know he didn't actually say it. He gets credited with it. But I'll defend your death to, to your death, the right to say things that I disagree with, right? That you can say something that I disagree with. You have the right to say it. I have the right to come back at you with an intellectual response. I made a lot of friends from that debate that disagreed with me, that added me to their friends. And we've had some, some discussions that have helped change my views because they did it in an open discussion and now i understand their views a lot better on how they feel about the issue of voting but it wasn't because they threatened to kill my family and so this is exactly it with bill weld sorry I heard it wrong. I, I, i'm gonna get i'm gonna get to the end of it hold on no no no. Oh. i just felt it wasn't you it was me oh you're good <laughs> it was the hamburgers here, here, here's the thing we have a guy that was famous as governor for lowering taxes and increasing revenue which is something that people feel like is a unicorn all the time, but he did it in Massachusetts. We had somebody who went after public corruption, went after problems in the legal system, went after all these bad things, professed these other good things. And what do we remember him for? Oh, he, 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 likes, he likes to take your guns, even though he changed his stands on that, and he vouched for Hillary Clinton which is a matter of semantics on how you want to view an endorsement. But he belongs in the Libertarian Party, and he's now a Republican. So think about that. The Republicans have gained a person because we are so toxic. The Republicans gained a person that is for lowering taxes, has changed his stance on guns, so we don't got to worry about that anymore, right? Pro-gun. Pro uh, 
anti-government corruption. They gained somebody that could have been an asset to us or that was an asset to us. I'm not saying I wanted him to be president, which everybody assumes when you defend him. But what I am saying is let the guy stick with us instead of trying to toxic him out. The people that come at us and say our candidate was better, they have public intoxication problems. They've had oopsie racist memes. They've had, I mean, these are just huge glaring problems. And so to say, well, you know where Bill Weld used to stand on guns, right? I mean, come on. Like you said, people relate to them because they say this guy represents me best. And so when you just totally dump on them, you totally dump on everybody that feels rep well represented by him. I just, it's not a good way to do business. This should be a pro liberty, pro love movement, and not an anti government, anti love movement. Pro violence. I mean, pro violence. Yeah. Yeah. So as a person who feels first and thinks second, you know, the opposite of you, I don't. I just don't get to that point a lot of time. I just don't, I go, okay, all right, fuck you. I'm out. Fuck yeah. you. You know what I mean? Like you just, and what I think a lot of liber a lot of libertarians are like you where they think first feel second, if you feel, and they don't realize that there are people like us out here who are going, ah, oh, why is he being mean to me? Like the, the intellectual rigor of it never enters into, into their brain. They're just looking at the hostile way that people are talking to them and it, it's a huge, huge problem. And, and it's, it's a lot of it's Facebook groups and creating echo chambers. I think Facebook groups largely have been hugely detrimental to society. Uh, I, I except think, for ours. Except for ours, which is really pretty tame. It could use yeah. more memes, to be honest. But, uh, well, I kind of checked out all the... All right. Yes, you did. <laughs> you, you've ruined it with your, it's all my with your liberalism. Final thoughts. Um, well, one thing is I find it very interesting that knowing what the GOP did to Bill Weld, how bad did we have to treat him to make him even s consider going back there? The hilarious thing are all the people going, oh, he promised to be in the Libertarian Party for mm -hmm. life. Like, and then you did everything. Like, he's a human being, you know. I think yeah. people think, oh, this is well, an was, avatar that I can just yeah. jump my feelings on. Like, this is a human being who has self-respect at and some he, level. he stayed longer than any of the other candidates in 2016. Yeah. yeah. Austin, yeah. two years later, was running as a Republican. Yep. Mm -hmm. And McAfee was out doing whatever, you know. McAfee things. <laughs> right, McAfee yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, Perry, you know, he's he's he's, he's a life for it. And, yeah. it, and I, re, I go into the convention, I, I learned to really, I really started to respect him a lot more than I did during the 2016, just because... I saw his dedication. And that's mm -hmm. the thing is you see people dedicated to stuff. Bill Weld in 2018 endorsed dozens of libertarian candidates, raised money, called them up, raised right. money. Yep. Uh, Laura Epke has a great comment that she made where she, when she made the switch, she, he got a, she got a call from him saying, how can I help? Right. So he was helping candidates. He was mm -hmm. doing the work and sticking with the party, even though the party was, so many in the party was treating them horribly. And we even had one share candidate who was using him to try and get uh, votes and try to gain power. We had in the caucus who's trying to, you know, do the same thing. And it's just. The, the, the problem is Bill Weld could have never run mm -hmm. next year because no, it would have been so, it would have ripped the party apart. It, it would have. And, and I don't think he should have run. He's 77 years old now. He's very right? boring. He's, he, he's not going, I don't think he's going to see everybody's, everybody's assuming he's going to run for president. He's going to make that announcement on Friday. I don't know that. I don't know if I suspect that he will, but I think he's probably kind of figuring that he's too old to be doing this. Bill Weld is responsible for former house speaker Boehner mm -hmm. supporting marijuana legalization. Yeah. Like, so that right there, Bill Weld lobbying, a former speaker of the house who wields immense power mm -hmm. is now an advocate for something that we believe in. And right. it's because of Bill Weld. He never gets credit for that. And that's, I think the point of this episode is that there's shades of good and bad in everybody. There's things that people do or don't do. And you never get to hear Bill Weld could be instrumental in getting federal legalization of marijuana. You're never going to get people giving him that credit and he should get that credit. Right, because he was he was him and Gary Johnson were doing that in the '90s when nobody was talking. Nobody, about that. Yeah. right? Yeah, well, yeah, it because it is a shame because 
with him coming and crossing over and crossing that line, he may have didn't want to be in the Republican Party and wanted to be in the Libertarian Party. And he still speak Republican. So as you change him, he can still he still has his foot and speak like the Republicans. Yeah. So he also helps get those other Republicans that are over there. You're like, well, I don't know. I heard those guys are dick. No, they're not. Come on over. It's a fine. I'm having a great time over here. That could have happened. Like we could have had, you know, how you, you say you want Justin Amash or Rand Paul to come over to the Libertarian Party. Why, Why would they? Why? After they yeah. saw what you just did to people who are arguably more libertarian than some of them are. Right. Rand's Why? probably never ever going to oh, go like, why would i he, go over there never, you saw what they did to him I, 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 do to me? Apart. I, yeah. I titled my article uh bill weld left the party and i don't blame him yeah yeah, yeah. i need yeah. to read the for my final thought the uh the rebuttal that i wrote yeah, i was that's... very proud of myself yeah and i'm also glad we, on this uh, episode we got to all agree that uh dear leaders and asshole the uh, what you know i'm tired of being treated this way i'm taking my toys and going home <laughs> <laughs> oh wait i own your microphone get out of my house <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every time you call him an a-hole, he turns the thermostat down just a little more here. Right, right, right. So you know. Reinhold, turn that down to 66. <laughs> I'm also glad that Hody gave us our Black History Month fact for the month. Which was? Huh? Oh, just talking about like uh, the – actually just glossed over uh, uh, free, free black uh, speeches in the, uh, the, the age of uh, uh, racial slavery in the United States. I would think I was getting my charger at that moment. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> like, was dying and Hody was making this great point. I was like, well, if Hody wants to keep making this point, I better walk away. Uh, <laughs> uh, anything else? The other thing is, um, I think one thing, like the people that are in the Libertarian Party, that they see these Facebook Libertarians, honestly, it's like it was, when they start going about, like, I, I, I feel awful for them because it's like a lot as all of them are there. I'm like, wow, can you imagine if all these guys actually paid dues and showed up to meetings? Well, the Terry Party have a lot of money. But yeah. They don't. It's they sit on 20, Facebook. 25 bucks a right. year. What's that's not a lot of it's money. It's not a lot of it's money. It's not a club. Stop focusing on membership. Get people elected. That's what people care exactly about. Right. Yeah. Nobody cares you about how many elected, you have. You get people elected, you have more people join the party. Right. I'm just talking about just like just having cash in the bank to do no, that. I, well, I get you. Yeah. Not having to do the uh, ballot access fights is going to be the biggest deal for 2020. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be it's going to be huge. It's going to be massive. So and I'm like, afraid we're going to lose it all. We're doing the same thing we did with uh, Berglund back in '84. Mm -hmm. You know, we lost 20 states, and because we had 50 ballot access, then we went down to like 20 something, and it was just. I don't know. I, and and we've had this fight. We've had this fight before. We can't learn from history, and it just frustrates me. And the one thing I really want to do, and this is my, this thing goes out to work for Chris Spangle that I want you to go out and get this opinion from. Ask Rob Kendall how he feels about what happened to Bill Weld. Yeah, because That'd be good get on the air. Yeah, yeah, because now it's like, all right, Rob is putting his toe in, is playing around mm -hmm. with it, seeing what happened to him. Come on, they would even yeah, take Rob. Kendall, I would even try. Rob yeah. Kendall, well, even try now. Rob's local radio talk show host. He's uh, been on this program a lot. We love Rob. Uh, he's considering running for governor of Indiana next year. He's been, and he's in. You know, Rob's not even a libertarian. Why would he? It's like okay, he's he's more high profile and more libertarian than the no candidates that you were going to run next year. Mm -hmm. And so, like the reality for the libertarian party is pull your head out of your ass. You have no power. If nobody wanting to join you, you bring nothing to the table. You don't have a vision for America. You don't bring any policies. Your presidential candidate in 2016 couldn't list his cabinet. Like, what do you bring to the table? Like, quit pretending that people like Bill Weld was taking over the Libertarian Party. He was using us for what? Yeah, like, what Bill was Weld was using you for what? To be to be abused by a he's bunch got, of people with he's no got power. More press in the past two weeks because he's talking about going and running as a Republican right. against Trump. Than he probably did during the election. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what he was using us for. It's like the reality is that if Larry Sharp were in the seat, he probably, because of who Larry Sharp is, had we known, he probably would have been just fine and probably would have gotten, they probably would have gotten three quarters of the media attention because of the virtue of the other two candidates. I think it's, I think it's fair to say 50 to 75% of the oh, media attention. They get a lot more media attention than Jill Stein did. Well, yes. for sure. And they were including Jill for Stein sure. just because they wanted balance on right. that. No. I mean, Weld was sitting by Johnson's side all the time. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that what is what is the reality? Bill Weld goes back to the Republican Party. Now people are talking about him. For how long? The reality is nobody's going to vote for that dude in the primary. Right. He's going to have the same experience That's that every other person who goes back, like 
ask Bob Barr how that works out. You go back and nothing happens because you're a traitor to them. You're a traitor to us. You're a man without a country. Mm -hmm. And so Bill Weld didn't use this party for anything because this party really doesn't have anything to offer anybody. And if you actually want people to take you seriously, like when I was hired at the Libertarian Party in 2008, I was hired from a radio station as a reporter, as a talk, like talk producer. They said, great, this is going to solve our media problems. We're going to hire the media guy. And I looked at them and I said, I'm not sending out any press releases. I'm not doing any media because you have absolutely nothing that interests the media. If you want the media to cover you, you have to be interesting. Mm -hmm. And four years later, we ran Rupert from Survivor for governor and, you know, Evan McMahon had policies and he had mm -hmm. a campaign headquarters. They had an RV. They had, mm -hmm. they had a real campaign with real volunteers yep. and, you know, money coming in and, and it mattered and the press covered it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like all the things that people bitch about are solved by hard work and nobody wants to do the hard work. And that's mainly because once somebody starts to do the hard work, they get attacked for it and somebody else has an opinion and you just at a certain point go, this is a waste of my time. I'm just yeah. going to focus on the hundred people in my life that matter. So uh, for my final thought, I'll read what I, I my follow up post uh, the next day uh, after I posted what I read you earlier. I need to apologize for my earlier post about Bill Weld. I said in ignorance and disinformation are bad and open dialogue is good, that a movement based on voluntary exchange and empathy ought to model it through reason, dialogue, and respectful debate. Somehow that was controversial because I said it about Bill Weld. I was clearly wrong when I thought that principles shouldn't change based on the person at the center of the discussion. Maybe it's the fault of the communicator. What I wrote was not a defense of Bill Weld, but a condemnation of the way we conduct business. Clearly, it was poorly written because commenters said I was a Weld supporter, a Republican, a Weld lover, a statist, and a dickhead. I promise not to take the hundreds of angry responses as a point proven. I will take it as a correction of my own behavior from here on out. I will conform to anything the libertarian movement wants, so I will fit in even when it violates my own beliefs. And uh, that got a lot of laugh reacts. But uh, so, yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us here on the show. Thank you, Hody. We appreciate you. I hope you stay warm out there in Mormon land. Oh, I, uh, especially with all my fat gone and my new keto stuff, it's been tough. It's, it's been that hard. First winter as a skinny guy is cold. Dude, a, a gust of wind came up just today when I was going to my car and I was like, oh, I need, I need to start wearing sweaters like an old white person is supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Reinhold, Harry, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Uh, let me stop the recording, and then we'll just jump right in. We'll make this uh, fairly short.